Welcome to yet another installment of Wildcat Focus, a series where we get together and look back on some of the finest moments in NMU athletics history. I'm Derek Maselli, and with me today, current NMU hockey head coach Grant Patoni, former NMU hockey coach and athletic director Rick Comley, current Wildcat forward Joseph Nardi, former Wildcat Dallas Drake. He also had quite an established NHL career in his time. At Northern, 92 goals, 128 assists. And a little later on, we will or should be at least joined by Radio Results Network Wildcat Hockey play-by-play man Dave Dennis. Many of you have heard his voices over the airwaves as we've followed this team along in recent history. So if you haven't guessed at home yet, today we are watching one of, if not the most intense collegiate hockey games in NCAA history. It's the 1991 championship between Northern Michigan and Boston University. Guys, pleasure having you on board to watch this classic with us. Great to be here. Yeah, film so here. rolling here as we've got uh, some very vintage looking uh, footage from the early 90s here. I think obviously best to start with some <laughs> thoughts from the guys who were actually there, Rick Dallas. I mean, this electric matchup and outstanding just as a standalone game, but uh, there's so much more than that. This really was the culmination of what many say is a storybook season also. Right, coach. Yeah. Well, you know, I've, I've got to think, you know, because sometimes I think I remember and, and it's not right. But anyway, you know, obviously, you know, we had a great year leading up to this weekend. We were very excited. We had a plane chartered in the middle, and believe me, we didn't always travel by plane, you know, and then the plane couldn't get there, couldn't take off. And we ended up having the bus, I think the next day, if I'm not mistaken, or that the day before the game. But we, we got to St. Paul either halfway through the banquet or at the end of the banquet. So we, we missed the banquet. We couldn't fly. So it was going to be a wild weekend. And it certainly started off that way. Now you had been in St. Paul previously for the WCHA championship because you played Minnesota, right? To win that. Was this the same rink then that that was? Yes. Yep. With the glass boards, it was very unique. You know, probably never see it again. So that was a good building to us. Uh, I can't remember exactly how many times we had played there prior to that, but we had great success. In fact, in Marquette, we called it Lakeview West. <laughs> Rick, did they have, was it the, fi- was it the final five then final four? Did, did everybody meet in St. Paul to, to, to play off for the champion? No, I don't know. I think we played on campus first. And then I think we went there with, I don't know if it was four teams or five teams. Okay. So you won your first round and then moved on. And that was hosted at the Civic Center with the, with the clear boards. Hey, Nards, look at the boards. They're clear. You can see, you can see like people's popcorn. And that's yeah, insane. They sounded funny, too. They didn't sound like boards when they shot a puck off. And they didn't come <laughs> off the same way. So it was interesting. I'd never played there, but I always, like they always had games. You know what I mean? Growing up, there's always games on. And um, I always wanted to play there so bad because it's probably the only rink that had those. Yeah, I would sure think so. Did they have the partition all the way to the bottom? Like you see that on the bottom there, almost like there's a partition. If you if you rimmed it around, could it hit it on the bottom? No, it couldn't. Okay, so those were outside. Yeah. Dallas, what was that like as a player? Like, obviously you jacked up to go to the Frozen Four, and and um, then the, the plane thing happens, and yeah. Well, I mean, we were obviously very excited to be there, but obviously you're going to realize real quick we were a little bit nervous to come out of the gates too strong because we were down pretty early in this one. But, um, you know, I think we had a, we had a pretty veteran-based team with a really good leadership course. So they, they always kind of found a way to keep us calm when they had to. Um, you know, obviously, them scoring there, they got off to a good start. But um, yeah, we, we were just a team that we didn't. We, when we got down a goal or two, we didn't get too frazzled because we always had enough guys that we knew we could score to come back. So it was just we, we were always a team that you know thought we could win every single night. So that was, I think that was the difference between us and other teams that I played for. That's a tough. When was our last loss? Like we were, we were undefeated the second half of the year. Yeah, 
It was. I think, Coach, I think is honestly, we lost uh, in Minnesota Duluth right before Christmas, and then we won the second game, the split there. I think that was our last loss. I was looking at that one day in the rink. So they got the um, the big board up with the picture, and you look at the – the. I mean, you're good before – before Christmas, you guys obviously had a good team. And then I think there's a tie maybe the second half of the year. But, I mean, did, was there any thought, you know, as a player, as a coach, like that maybe we should, you know, at some point, like if you – do you hope that you continue – obviously you hope you want to keep winning, but, you know, getting maybe a loss out of the way and at some point, you know, before the playoffs happened, was there any concern about that? I don't not I, I don't think from my standpoint, you know, I, it's funny, like you kind of wonder at what point did you realize this might be actually a good possibility. And I think for me it was a game in Wisconsin. And I think it was the second half Dallas that we were losing like five two or something. And that was such a tough rank for us right. to play. We were always such a good team. And we came back and tied that game. And I think yeah. at that point I really thought, you know what, if we just keep it together. You know, this can really happen. Right. And I think I mean, looking back at it, you know, the rules are a little bit different than as far as how you advanced. And if we won the league and won the playoff, we knew we had a pretty good chance of getting a by that first week. And we had to, we got to play at home uh, for our next one. So we, if I'm, I, I think I'm right, Coach, when we played Alaska, you know, we won the WCHAs, we won the WCH playoffs, and we got a bye to, for that first round. And then we played Alaska and went right to the final four. Yeah. So, so I mean, we knew that we us at home was we were pretty much unbeatable in Lakeview. And uh, for us to get that home ice advantage was a, a, our golden ticket to, to give ourselves a chance to get where we wanted to go. Who'd they beat? Do you remember who Alaska beat? Because that was like a storybook for them, too, to make it that far. Yeah. Yeah. Boston College. Yeah, and then Lake State lost that weekend too, Coach. Remember, so Lake State lost to somebody, and that because they I, they got some, they got beat by somebody, and then that kind of swapped other teams around, and we got Alaska. I, I'm, I think that's how it wor worked out. Jim, you know, in itself is amazing when you think in, in this day and age, in, in that day, for a two or three year period, the best two programs in the country were Northern Michigan and Lake Superior. You know, a lot of people would never believe that that could have ever happened. Yeah. What do you think? Like, obviously, you've been through a lot of eras and different coaching, different places. What What do you think contributed to that? I mean, obviously, great recruiting, but um, you know, like if that happened today, like you you could see, you know, a lot of teams that are like us do very well, but to have the best two teams in the UPs unique. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. Dalio had a few good thoughts on this too, but you know, it's funny. I don't really find it, whatever the great word is. Jeff Jackson was at Lake Superior. His, go back over his record, tremendous job. And you know, great contacts in Detroit, coaching in Detroit, the Midgets, and kids wanted to play for him. And so they did. And then I think with us, we had a tremendous, I mean, it was a great team. When I watch it, I watch this game back. I think of the talent, how we could score. You know, like players like Dally had, what, 200 and some career points. And people don't do that today. And Mark Buffet was, I think, going, he, Mark's going in the Hall of Fame this year, which is very deserving, you know, for him. But we call him the best fourth line center in the country. But he was a great player. I mean, he was a first, second, third, fourth line guy. And we just had great depth. And what I attribute it to is, you know, our staff, Walt, I think is perhaps the best recruiter of all time and was a real good head coach and, and did very well, but a great, great recruiter. And Maury, you know, and, and Dougie as a student assistant, Billy Rowe, you know, I mean, when you think of the makeup of the whole thing, you know, we, we, we were fortunate enough to get out and find players and we, you know, we took a chance on a couple of guys too. You think of Tony Zabel and Joey Frederick, you know, they were not eligible. They just sit here. And they were key contributors, you know, in our team. And just, you know, and Daryl Pandowski and Dean Angelos from up in Lloyd Minster. And, you know, I mean, it's the makeup of the team and where they came from is, is a big part of the whole story. Yeah. I think we just had a lot of guys, too, that came in together that knew each other going in there. Like, you look at my class, 
You know, I was good friends with Suki, Phil Sukroff. Then you had Louie and Mark Buffet. They came in together, so they knew each other. You know, Dino and Daryl Plandowski. Then you got Jimmy Hiller and, and Scott Beatty. They all knew each other going in there. So it was a real easy transition for a lot of us. And it just made that it made us much, much more successful because we felt comfortable, um, you know, in their surroundings. And the players we were playing with were very similar to the type of players we grew up playing against and playing against in junior. So... Um, a lot different now, obviously, when you're recruited, it just seems that uh, players kind of from all different areas. But back then, you know, the BC League was very highly recruited back then, and we had a lot of kids from Western Canada. So um, it was it was fantastic. Who are you when you came, when it came down to the last couple of schools, Dallas? Who was it? Oh, I didn't have the last couple of schools. <laughs> uh, Northern, Northern. When I I. I, my dream school, I, was, I, I, I always wanted to go to Denver because my one of my best friends was going to Denver. Um, and then Northern recruited me. They were the first team. I, I remember a coach asked me, offered me a scholarship that weekend, and I said, absolutely, I'm coming here. So, well, I was – I knew Kevin Scott pretty well. I grew up playing against Scotty, so that was comfortable for me knowing somebody that was there. Um, for me, it was a small town. I came from a tiny town, so I, I – once I got there, I was around the team and stuff like that. And, you know, the city in itself wasn't really big. That that made me feel very comfortable. So there wasn't any first, second, or third choice for me. I was I didn't have many schools knocking on my door. So um, and I was excited that Northern was interested in me. So that's how it worked out. You know, I remember sitting in that restaurant with you and Suki, you know, and you made the offer, this and that. And you guys, you know, I don't know if you accepted the break that night, but... It, you did quit, but you know, Grant. When I think back, Dallas at that point, he wasn't heavily recruited. But I'll tell you what, he committed, and then he took off because you ended up having an unbelievable second half in the BC League and ended up leading the BC, BC League in scoring. I think, you know, so certainly there were a ton of schools interested after he had committed and, and got on that hot run. It's, it's the same now. Like it's funny. Um, I think you and I talked about. I read the book. Um, in my mind, I, you know, because you said Lake State had it going and you guys had it going. And, um, in my mind, I felt recruiting was a little bit different than for you guys. Uh, but in, uh, I can't remember who wrote the book. You know, you had mentioned like we, we take a chance on guys. You know, we got to take a chance on talent and take a chance on guys. And um, it's funny, you know, many, many years later, everybody's still doing it. You know, you got to be right. But, um, you know, I guess I felt like you were able to go into places and, and pull who you wanted out of there, but talking to you said it's very similar. Well, wow, that's a good start. Seven to one shots. Yeah, it is. But again, you know, in it's just, the game's so different today. Like it's so hard to score today. It's hard to get shots on net, and you know, in, in, in that era right there, you look at our team. Look at BU's team was a great team with great talent. I think they had about ten guys playing the National Hockey League off of that team. But uh, you could score goals. You would, if you had offensive skill, you were going to get opportunities. And we, we were blessed with lines that could score top to bottom. So, you know, that's a luxury not many coaches have today. Yeah, absolutely. We had four, like you said, Mark Buffet was our fourth line center. I think he had, I don't know how many points Booth had that year, but he might have had 45 points. He was our fourth line center. So we had depth out the yin yang. And, and like you said, the game was completely different. You know, obviously the way they call the game and us and the hooking and the holding, but it's not like we didn't have guys that couldn't move. We had a lot of really guys that could move, move their feet and beats. And, you know, Kevin Scott was a great skater. So we had, it was, it was a fast, you look, it's funny. You look at BU's first line, it was Kachuk. Tony Amante and Sean McKecker. I mean, they were both two of them are first round picks and left for the NHL pretty, pretty much immediately. And McKecker followed. And so they, they had a lot of really good players. So. You know what I chuckle about Dallas in this day is that your wedding. You know, down in Traverse City, you know, we were down there and, and uh, I, I say, I always want to say Tay Chuck. So Chuck, like when you're ready, Mary came up to me and he said, no, he said, you got to tell me, how did you guys do it? Yeah, how did you beat us? Because they knew how good they were too. Yeah, you know, I, I still chuckle about that. Yeah, yeah, he's still to my day one of my dearest friends, and I still the coach. All I gotta do is bring up that game once in a while, and he just, just pisses him right off. So it's great. <laughs> yeah. Who did you? Did you? I know you played um, 
I, well, I don't know. I guess I think you played. Who else is on Plandowski's line? Because that's who you played against them, right? Did you guys have last change? I can't remember. We have White Sox, <laughs> so maybe we did. But well, you know, the line Dean Angels is a tremendous guy. He was he was a, a prototypical shutdown player today. That you would, every everybody wants him on their team. He just he wasn't flashy. He didn't need a lot of attention. He could play every situation. He was great on faceoff. He and Daryl were a great one-two punch. I think Joey Frederick basically started on that one. Mm -hmm. You know, and then when we went to overtime, Mark Buffet moved to right wing on that one. Dave Shyak to this day thinks he should have got it. <laughs> he, he had a couple of shifts that game, but yeah, he's he, <laughs> he got pulled off there, and he and he we, he admits that now after a couple of beers, he'll always admit to it. But he needs a couple of beers before he admits that. He's judging it, yeah. I played golf with Dean last summer and uh, a couple guys up there. And so, I mean, it's, just, it's so good that like, it just fits him perfect to hear that. He had to buy all new clothes and all new golf clubs. Like he had to borrow golf clubs because he didn't even have clothes to wear. He's like, all I got is jeans and cowboy boots. So he's got like stickers on his clothes to come out and play. He actually played pretty good. Uh, <laughs> it's a good time with those guys. Johnny Good was there. Um, that was a good time. Yeah. You know, really, really, he was like really good player. He's probably one of the best two fat two way players I've ever played with. Cause he could score and, you know, play on the power play, but at the end of every game, you wanted him on the ice every time. And, you know, he's one of those silent leaders that didn't say much, but he led by example. And like I said, he, th those guys are the reasons we had so much success because our leadership with pods and Dino and Brad Varenka and we had, we had great, great players. What was the Rinka story? Like he, he didn't play his whole junior year. Is that something like that? Or he was hurt or this was kind of like this year was like the, the his coming out party. Right? He was, it was a draft pick though, right? Pretty high pick. Yeah. He was a high profile player. Even as a young player with the midget. And it, it's the first exposure I'd ever had with an agent. And, he, and technically he was an agent, not even yet. You know, it was uh, his representative and we had to meet. I had to fly to Montreal in the, during the draft to meet with Donnie Meehan to convince him that Northern was a good place for Brad to come to. And so we came, you know, and, and Brad, Brad kind of beat to his own drum. And he did things his way, you know, and you know, he was a very, one thing, not only do we have great players, but we have really sharp guys, Jimmy Hiller. You better have a reason for why you told Jimmy Hiller something or <laughs> if it didn't make sense to him, he wasn't doing it, you know, and, uh, you know, and Brad was very, very similar and he did fit out, but God, when he, as a senior, you know, and more than that, he was just as dynamic a player as there was in the country, maybe ever from that position. And we, we realistically had the best forward and the best defenseman in the country that year on our team. And neither one of them won the Hobie Baker. Don't ask me how that didn't happen. Exactly. Scott Beatty had 49 goals that year and led the nation. Don't ask me how him or Brad Neither one of them didn't win that award, but uh, it was mind-boggling to me. Who won it that year? Was it? It was ninety-one Sacco. That makes sense. Uh, no, I think he was my. I think he was my year. I think Sacco oh. or Scott Pellerin, one of those two. Maybe I get them mixed up. Maybe yeah, it could have been Sacco. You're right. Definitely Eastern, though. I think. Beats led the country in scoring too, right? I think he led everything in scoring. I mean, he's, he was 49 goals. I don't know how many points he ended up with, but you know, I know he had 49 goals in like 40 something games. He was crazy good, man. He was such a good college player. And that line complimented each other so much. Like Kevin Scott was kind of unheralded and could get up and down and shoot the puck. And Jimmy Hiller was just a tremendous all round player. Mm -hmm. Went on to play in the National Hockey League with, with LA and Detroit. And, you know, so. <laughs> You just you can go on and on about the talent that people probably get tired of hearing it, but God, it's so true. Dallas's right. line, a great line too. I want to mix up with Tony Zabel. Yeah, and he, and Tony Zabel was. A, I think Zabes is a redshirt. Zabes is the only guy that was became a redshirt shesh, freshman and a senior the next year. It was great. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but he scored thirty nine as a as a thirty nine goals as a redshirt freshman. He could score. He wasn't scared to shoot it. But That's yes, he could really shoot the puck. Did you think about taking a time out here, Rick, when it was three nothing? 
Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, it's funny, we talk all week about how good BU started, how important it was, you know, the first five minutes of the game. Oh, coach talk, you know, really laying the ground seed to do things properly. And, you know, we're going to come out and keep it even and not, not open it up too much early. And we're down 3 nothing before we could blink. Yeah. But it was trust again. It was just a belief, right or wrong, that we were not out of it. We were down yesterday at a great start, but all we had to do is get one to really get going, and that's what happened. Dallas, how's how was the bench when you guys were down three nothing with ten minutes in? You know, it's funny because we we'd been like Coach said, we've been in that position before. You know, during the course of the year, obviously not in the, in the situation we're in here, but we didn't. We just sat there. We we just kept playing. I think once we got into the locker room, we really need to catch our breath. So you know, that, that, that once we got that break, we were able to regroup a little bit. A couple guys said something. Coaches didn't say very much. I mean, but I remember they came in and said a couple things, but I think they knew as much as we did that, uh, you know, we could get back in it and, and we knew we could. So our, we were always just a calm group. I mean, <laughs> we had a, we had a good group of guys that loved playing with each other. And like I said, we knew we were never out of, we had a 49 goal score, a 39 goal score. We had lots of guys could put it in the net. And like coach said, we just had to get that first one. And once we did, you know, obviously the, the momentum changed quite a bit. One of the things that we've touched upon here, obviously the talent of all those involved with three All-Americans, I think, on this team. And we'll refer, I guess, to our coaches here with Grant and Rick. But one of the things that is often heard as a cliche, but really seems to be cliche and true for a reason, is you can talk about amassing a lot of talent, but so much of it comes down to character as well. And it seems like just from hearing you talk about the different personalities on these team guys who were very talented, but also had the work ethic, had the desire to win and had the strong mental fortitude required to not be dissuaded or discouraged by falling down three, nothing in a very, very, very big game like this. Yeah. I agree. You know, know, a player we haven't even mentioned is Willie Malone, you know, and they're they're talking about heart and soul and, he had hurt his ankle. I don't remember he hurt. I don't know if he hurt in practice or anything in that Thursday night game, you know. But he couldn't even walk. He couldn't put a ski on. you. There's no chance he was going to play in this game. And Astas, you know, our trainer tried to tape him every which way he could imagine to get his foot in a skate so he could try to at least skate, and he couldn't. Every time they taped him, he put the skate on. He bloody. He couldn't skate. Finally, Louis said to Stas, "Let me try it without any tape whatsoever." And so Stas said, well, that's not going to work. You know, but he, he let him try, and he said, no, nope, I can do it. I can play. And he did. He played the whole game. Oh. You know, it's it, the only cha- national championship game I've ever coached in. Um, you know, Joe asked you at Dallas about the bench. Uh we were winning the game two to nothing and the shots were like 13 to two. And um, I thought, boy, we're, we're playing great. And I looked over at union's bench and you would think there'd be some sort of, it was like the first TV title or something. They were so dead, calm, cool, collected. I was like, Ooh, we might be in trouble here. And they did exactly what you guys, they scored three goals almost at, at the end of that period. It was three to two. And we just could never come back from it because it was just, like they like they just figured like they were good. We got it. Right. I think there's a lot to be said about that. Just being in that position and know how to react. I mean, I mean, obviously we, you know, and I. It's funny. I, I go back to that team and I watch. I mean, obviously we had a ton of skill, but I'll never forget doing cycling drills until my brain was going to blow out of my head down in the offensive zone, just in small areas. And like, so we we were able to play games uh, a lot of, and win games in a lot of different ways. I mean. If you wanted to run and gun with us, we were okay with that. But if you were, we were also able to grind you down and win the one, one or two, one game. So it was, we just had a lot of confidence and we could play any style you wanted to play in that particular time. And, you know, I think BU was a team that they really liked to go and we weren't ready in the start of the period, but <laughs> once we figured them out, we were, we were able to adjust and, and, and come back in, this, in a different direction that they didn't expect us to be able to play. So we had some physical guys. Eddie Ward's a big guy. Mark, I mean, Mark Olson likes to bang across. We had guys that aren't scared to bang guys around. Dave Shyack. So we could we could win, win in a multiple different different ways that a lot of teams really couldn't. 
Hey, Dali, do you think right now that if you look back, do you think that the weight vest had anything to do with? Oh my God, coach. <laughs> I was, coach, you say that's so funny because I was, I was, I was practicing with my little Bantam kids the other day and I, and I was telling them that when we used to skate college, we put weight vests on and they're like, like he thought they thought it was like a life jacket. They're like, what do you mean? Like, I'm like, no, it's a, it's a vest with a lot of weight in it. Like, what, how much weight? It's like five pounds? I'm like, no, they were like 30 some pounds. Like, my back still hurts this day, coach, because of those weight vests. So, oh my gosh, those things were heavy. That's a good idea. Maybe we should try that, Nards. Oh. And maybe on the down and backs. <laughs> I think we did them every Monday. So the players yeah, every Monday. Monday. Monday, we'd always resurface, come back out and do a little bit more practice. And then we'd, then we'd have at her. It was Monday, was. Those are hard days. 20 minutes. 20 minutes. And Grant, you'd appreciate this. It came from Jack Latherwick. Cardiac Jack. Yeah, the weight vest. Yeah, I, and I believe him. I think with Dallas. I think it got Dallas to the National Hockey League. I, I, I honestly believe that. And I mean, he had skill. He had the head. He had everything it took. But I think it just made him so strong. Lake wise, yeah. you know, he didn't have to be 230 pounds because, you know, he, he, was, he was grizzled, you know, and all the guys hated him. No, there wasn't anybody who liked him. Dell didn't get a kick out of this. A couple of years later, you know, you had, you know, you know how I was, but you know, I had a player, Chad Sawyer, you know, who I I thought had great potential, and I had to keep pushing him in my mind for him to get better and better. And so I got mad at him one day, and I made him put a, a weight vest on. I forgot he had it on. He had to, and he practiced the whole practice. <laughs> I'm sure he hasn't forgotten that. <laughs> Yeah, it's tough, tough to forget that one. Would you like do that like down and back, or would you do like like edge work? Was there? Do you remember what I, you did? Well, no, it was everything. It, it I started, you know, down and back. Then it went to red, blue, blue, red, down and back. You know, and then eventually I went to circles. You know, half circles and full circles. You know, and, and then uh, you know, I, basically that was it. That would take about twenty minutes, and that's what we did. Yeah. Yeah, you guys take your shoulder, have to take all your shoulder pads and everything off because you couldn't get it on over your shoulder pads. So pretty much just take it off and slide out there and yeah. down and back slot. Sometimes we did like 60 seconds. You just kind of go down and back for 60 seconds. I remember that until your 60 seconds was up. Felt like 60 minutes. But it was, it, it may I tell you what, it, we didn't lose a lot of games in the third period. I'll tell you that much. No. <laughs> I don't think I could get away with it today. <laughs> In fact, you know, when I went down to Michigan State, you know, I had them order them. They didn't take they didn't take well the way they was. They, we didn't use them very long there. They they weren't very accepting of that. <laughs> I mean, yeah, just even knowing that too, every every Monday as a player to know like we gotta get through practice and then we got the, you know, put on the, the vest. I mean, it, when you're winning, it's like, let's go. But I'm sure when you had it early in the year, you're thinking, what is happening today? Down, back, down, back. But it pays off. It didn't matter win or lose either. I mean, we could play great in the weekend. We still did them on Mondays. Yeah, we knew it. Every it, Monday, it, it, was, um, we did. We, we had it on. Probably goes back to why you guys are so mentally strong. <laughs> Part of it, I believe, and I always yeah. believe, it. I still, still believe it, you know. But I, I think, you know, I think what Dallas said several times, it, it's the makeup and the mentality. You know, like I can talk to you about Dallas Drake, I can talk to you about Dean Antos, Daryl Plandowski. You know, then I can talk to you about Dave Shyack, about Lou Malone, about Phil Sukaroff, about Garrett McDonald, and the make the Billy Pie. You know, the old time style goalie, Billy Pye, who's got his own go goaltending academy now down in Dallas. You know, and it just, it takes a unique set of players put together to believe in each other and then everybody to believe they can help a team win. And I think when you get a group like this, you know, it, 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 there was competition probably to lead the team in scoring, but there was also great competition to have a role identified and be willing to play that role and be really good at it. And, and we had guys that did that. Not just us. I'm sure every good team, you know, has that. But this team had it for sure. Did you move your lines much during the year? Once you kind of got them going, you just kept them because, like, would you lose five games all year, six all year, something like that? I don't think we did a lot because I, I, I felt that there was some really like beats with with Jimmy Hiller and Kevin Scott was a natural. They'd been together in junior, 
you know, Dally with Eddie and Tony worked, you know, and maybe Dally remembers it better than I do. And then, then Daryl and Dean Angelos together was a perfect match. And Joe Frederick was a tremendous player. Like, I think he had the heat set an NCAA record at one time for shorthanded goals. That's how good Joe was, you know? So it was just, and then Mark McVay, probably if there was a mix and match, it was more with Booth having a lot of different wingers over time. Yeah. I just think you get, we had a lot of interchangeable parts. So, I mean, like with the exception of maybe Beach's line, um, you know, that line was, and Dino, Dino's line, anybody could plug in and play with those guys. You know, me and Zaves played a lot that year of my career there. And I had Eddie one year and other wingers. So we just had, we had guys that played together and, and you could interchange guys so seem, seamlessly. And, you know, a lot of lines, that doesn't work with a lot of teams. You, you change the lineup and it's a disaster for two weeks. You know, so you know, we had guys that would just step right in and it was a comfortable plan there. And we were a pretty selfless team, like Coach said. We didn't care. I mean, yeah, everybody wanted to get their goals and assists. I mean, who doesn't? But at the end of the day, when we won, we were pretty excited for each other. So that was one of the, that was the best team. I, I've said this over and over again until I won the Stanley Cup. So that was the highlight of my, my hockey career is winning the national championship. So, you know, so that, that was by far one of the best teams I was ever a part of. Did, I, did you meet with, you played Maine on, on Thursday, right? You played, you beat Maine to get here. Did you talk to Sean Walsh at all about you? Cause I mean, I can't imagine there's a ton of video be passed back and forth then. We talked big time. Big you time. did. Sean, Sean and Jackie were not friends. You okay. Know, they're, they're rivals. And Sean and I, you know, we worked together for years and years through Ron Mason at Huron Hockey School. So we had a, we had a very big time existing relationship. So Sean and I talked, we talked at length about BU and how they played and now, Sean was a master of a coach, just a tremendous coach in great detail, you know, and so he had his own ideas and, and, you know, I sat and listened and, you know, and like you said, it wasn't, there had to be some video, I don't remember exactly how much, but, but certainly I think the information I got from, from Sean played as big a role as anything else in, in me mentally being ready for this game. Do you remember anything like in particular that stuck out? Yeah, start, don't let him get out of the box too quickly. <laughs> uh, but I, no, I don't. I don't particularly that that way. I, I think you know what I did. Probably maybe you do today too as a coach is you know is knowing for sure what their power plays were. You know, uh, getting an idea how aggressive they were in penalty killing. Uh, and other than that, how much more can you really do? I mean, you've, you've got your team and your style and, you know, they have their team and their style. And I, you know, I think I was a great believer in, in a sound approach to the game and giving guys freedom to play, but always having a high forward, always having people work hard coming back, uh, you know, trying to attack in numbers and, you know, and, and like Dallas said, cycling, you know, I, again, I was, a great believer in possession, offensive zone possession. And we, we would cycle and cycle and cycle, you know, and a lot of that came because, you know, you know, Herb Brooks did it with the Olympic team. Doug Rube started it in college hockey. And it was one of those things, well, we better learn to do that if we're going to compete at a high level. And we got really, really good at it. So, you know, and we just wanted to make sure that I think that we had the puck and we weren't letting teams race, constantly race at us. A team like BU, as good as they were, they could do that and they could generate that. But certainly our belief was get it, get possession, control the tempo of the game, control the flow of the game, you know, and then dominate people physically that way and then take it to the net. I think we, we lost to Maine earlier that year too, Coach, if I'm not mistaken, in Maine. I think that helped us. I mean, they beat, if I, one of I remember, they beat us pretty handily up there. Um, and they and that, that Johnny Zwa who was obviously one of the most prolific, prolific scorers in the country. And, you know, Scott Palloran and plays like players like that. They had some good players, but, you know, losing to them and playing them once kind of gave us a little bit of a taste of what Maine did and did well. And obviously our coaching staff <clears throat> adjusted very well against them as well. So um, going into that, that semifinal game, you know, <laughs> the way we got there, <laughs> we had a little versus getting there, but we were definitely very prepared. 
I got a Daryl story for you too, but yeah, you know, you know, the kick out of that. Yeah, Daryl was just hired to be the director of studying with Arizona. Yeah. You know, and so they called me one day, wanted to do a story on him coming into the organization. And I said, well, the one the story, you know, went on and on about him as a player, a captain, you know, and his ability in hockey and why I thought he became a good scout, this and that. But I said, story I can remember. They wanted something, you know, a little bit different. I said, well, we played at Maine. And uh, we knew how good Maine was, and we'd got beat up there. But Daryl's job, because every time we played a team with a real good line, it was the Antos Bandowski group that would play against them. And so he was matched up with this uh, young, was it Wani's Roy? Yeah. Uh, why? You know, and uh, they, I think they both had hat tricks or something in that game. We were at the McDonald's. We traveled in style, and we eat in style in those days. So we stopped at McDonald's after the game, and we were eating, and he came into McDonald's. And we were all in line and he came up to the counter and said, where is this Plandowski kid? He said, I want to meet him. <laughs> I know drove him crazy, you know, shattering him all over the ice. Because in those days, uh, Grant, we would shatter. If you were covering somebody, you just didn't match a line with a line. You put a player on a player and his job was you skate with him from the bench to the play. You skate everywhere he goes. And when he's leaving the ice, you take him back to the bench door. And then you come to our bench. So he, he knew it very well by the time that weekend was over. We were talking about that the other day. Like, I don't know that any of our guys would understand that. Like, I remember the old line. Hey, if he's going to get a hot dog, you put ketchup on it for him. And then you bring yeah. him right back with him. But, like, some of the younger guys don't probably don't remember that because it's just it doesn't happen anymore. But no, no, not like that. Yeah, I totally remember those that that day, those days. Oz was one of those guys too. He was uh, pretty quick witted too, so he, he knew what to say, when to say, and he had no teeth when he was saying it, so it sounded a little more funnier. So he was he was very good at what he did. He's uh, he, had a, he had a very good dry sense of humor that a lot of guys didn't understand until the day next day after. And that would be the worst guy to shadow you because you're already annoyed, and then if he's talking to you too, it'd be the absolute worst. <laughs> No, there's a lot of characters make up everything. I'll tell you, let me tell you one more. Tell me if I'm talking too much because I have a tendency to get excited and get going. But remember, we were playing at Wisconsin and Billy Pye, who played most of the games, wasn't playing that night. Robbie Krulak was. And then Dave Shyak was sitting on the bench and Billy's right beside him. And the faceoff was right in front of our bench. And they had a defenseman, number six, really good player, but not a great skater. And Billy was chirping at him. And he finally got fed up with that. And he thought it was shit that was chirping at him. And he turned around and said, okay, Shia, I'm going to come to your power skating school. The <laughs> <laughs> shit had a tendency to be a little knock me when he skated. Little. <laughs> so there, there are lots of those moments. Were they the second best team that year, Wisconsin? Ooh, they were good. Minnesota was good. Well, North Dakota, as always, I think was good. It was a good league. I mean, it was tough. I, I don't know. I don't know who finished where. Do you, Dally, remember that? Uh, I don't know who finished where. I, I obviously know where we finished, but I think, you know, I, I want to say Minnesota because we, we beat them in the finals, right? It was, then we beat them in the playoffs that year. Okay. In the, in the, the, the WCHA finals, I thought we beat them. Um, I think it's was, it was kind of the cast, regular cast of characters. It was us, Minnesota, Wisconsin, North Dakota. It seemed like they were always there. Those were tough buildings. I mean, the old Ralph, Dane County, Lakeview, um, the old Mar Mariucci. Mariucci, yeah. Those are tough rinks. Mariucci is really tough. You know what I remember about Mariucci? They got like the locker room that was hot. They'd come down the hallway because they had to walk by your locker room to get to the stairs to go up to the rink. And they, they would bang that there was metal piping in the ceilings. And they'd walk down the hallway banging that ceiling with their stick as they walked by your locker room and then tromped up those stairs to go to the rink. And you know what I always remember too about that year at Minnesota is we were playing and they were beating us on a given time. And the, bent, the benches were kind of open there so the crowd could get to you and you could hear them. And uh, they were on me constantly, constantly. I just remember one guy finally yelling, hey, he said, hey, Kamloy, 
how do you like your Canadians now? <laughs> but obviously the roster is more balanced now, perhaps than it was. How many Canadians did you guys have? Eight or nine? That year? It was a pretty good mix. You know, it had it was at least that. It was probably more than that. You know, because, you know, Dino and Pod and, you know, Dally and Suki and Garrett, Brad, Jimmy, Brad, the backup goalie, you know, the BD line was all Canadian. So there had to be 12 in that ballpark. Yeah, in other words, Minnesota was just Minnesota guys. Really? Whole team. Wow. How long did that go on for? Oh, score, you right? Yeah, I thought that didn't score. You know, the, the, it was very rare. In fact, in, in Herbie's day, Herbie Brooks, you know how we talk about recruiting and going out finding players. Herbie would have meetings after the college, the college season was over and after the Minnesota high school season was over, and the best players in the state would all meet out in the lobby, and he'd call them in one at a time and tell them whether they'd be allowed to play for the University of Minnesota. Some of them were lucky enough to get money, but many, many didn't. And that's how important it was at that time, you know, to be from Minnesota and to play at Minnesota. A little bit different now. Once those North Dakota guys started going to Minnesota, things became a little different. A million years ago. Yeah. There's Dean. We just talked about him. That was a nice goal, actually. Quick hands. Oh, I agree. I sweated long and hard as to whether, you know, we could get him eligible. We had to appeal him. You know, he had played, I think, five or six games of major A hockey at that time in the West. And oh, there was an appeal process, but there was no guarantee. And you, you had to get him enrolled. And appeal them and to find out. And it took a while, you know, but we went through the process, had a great support staff doing it, and we got them cleared. That was a big day. How many guys did that? Was that was that common? No, it wasn't common, but it was growing. It was growing. People once once a couple got cleared, then you you know, as, the hard thing was getting accurate records, you know, as to what getting people to tell the truth, getting records of how many games somebody actually played, and then getting an NCAA committee to take the time to really look at it and make a judgment, you know, as to whether they should be eligible. And how many games were too many? I don't, I don't have an answer to that. I mean, if somebody had played 20, probably wouldn't have got clear. If they played five or less, you know, then I think they got clear. There's the old jacket, Dally. Yeah, man. Every sa every Saturday night, every Friday night, I think I wore that. A green one on Saturday and a, yep. a camel on Friday. So I my kids still joke about that. <laughs> and I still have one. Not the original one, but I still have one. <laughs> Don't get to wear it anymore, but I have it. <laughs> Who did BU beat? Do you remember? Who was the fourth team? Did beat North Dakota? I can't remember. I can't either. Might have been. Let's see. I'll bet you. I'll bet you it was North Dakota. They seem to be there every year. Yeah. Dally, have you seen their new rink? No, I have not. Oh, boy. Well, like I've been in, like, I've been in that rank. Just but that, 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 that's how. What do you mean new? How new is new? Well, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I've been, I've been in there, but I'm sure they've done up. The last time I was in there was when, when my last year in Detroit. I mean, and it was amazing then. I can only imagine if they made improvements to it. So, yeah, I don't, I don't think they could. I mean, they spent 100 million on arena. Yeah, I have been there. It, it's crazy nice. Yeah, just looked it up. It was Clarkson, actually. Oh, Clarkson. There you go. Mark Morris probably was the coach at that time. That was a hard place to play, man. North Dakota? Oh, my God. Yeah. That was so hard to play there. And they were always so good. Yeah, always good, yeah. 
I was probably in the stands yelling at you back in the day. <laughs> <laughs> With my that, was my, that was my first. That was my first college game. Was that we played at North Dakota when my freshman and holy talk about getting thrown to the wolves. Throwing the throwing snowballs at your bus. Yeah. You know, the college hockey right there. I was like, holy moly. So. Nards, the, the locker room was underneath. I swear it felt like it was underneath the student section. But like they'd let all their students in for free. And you'd be sitting in. I always felt like that room was hot. You'd sit in that room. And I mean, you're playing North Dakota. I mean, like they're, they're going to try. You could hear them stomping on you. I can't imagine that being your first game. Like, yeah. what, what is this? Yeah. yeah. I was throwing it, hey, it's three to fire early. It was, it was fun. It was a great experience, but holy moly, you come out of that weekend thinking, what yeah. am I getting myself into here? <laughs> you, you learn as you go, right? Yali, let me tell a story on you. We were playing in Denver, you know, and Denver is always still tough to this day, go there, the altitude. And so, uh, you know, maybe it was this year, I'm not even sure. But anyway, so, we know how tough it is going there. We know it's going to, everybody's going to be really uptight about it. And so we told, we told the team that we had come up with some altitude pills that, uh, you know, if you have trouble breathing, you know, and we can't get you enough oxygen, that we've got some pills you can take that will help just immediately and you'll be fine. So Dally is early in a game on a Friday, Denver is playing and he's extended his shift a little bit, like he had a tendency to do at times. <laughs> he's back to the bench, he's gasping. For air, he can't breathe. He climbs over the bench. He says, "I gotta have a pill. I gotta have a pill." So we give him one of these pills. It's a sugar pill. So he swallows the pill, takes a drink of water. He says, "Okay, I'm fine now." <laughs> never, never could say I was a smart guy, Coach. Sorry. <laughs> but one last thing I got to admit to. Okay, Grant. Okay. Now we get a kick out of this too. One of Dally's best friends came on a recruiting trip with him was Dean Jackson, who's been an assistant at North Dakota for a long time, but a very successful coach. That was a really good player. And so we, on the recruiting trip, we went bowling, Dally, if you remember. Oh, yeah. And so we go bowling, and at the end of the game, you know, Dally did okay, not great, he did okay. Dane Jackson had a nine. A nine. 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 And after I said to Walt, we can't recruit him. We can't possibly recruit him. You know, if he can only get a nine to bowling, he's not going to get better as a player. And and I didn't recruit him. I mean, how stupid can you be? <laughs> you're, you're for real, I, didn't recruit him. I didn't recruit him. <laughs> I mean, I didn't recruit him anyway, but he had a nine. I said, nobody could get a nine. Uh, I can't <laughs> wait to see him next. <laughs> yeah. I played with Dano in uh, in Vernon, and uh, grew up. And he grew up half an hour from where I grew up. So, and he ended up. Yeah, you know, obviously he went to North Dakota. He was a he might have been a third round pick, like right out of junior, oh. if I'm not mistaken. He was a high. You know, he came as an 18 year old kid out of tier two. He got drafted in the third round. Good so. strong player, good player. How stupid, man! Can you believe somebody would make a decision like that? You know what, though? Like, it's funny how you do it. Like, you might you might not have won with him. You know, you don't take him because of bowling, and <laughs> actually, one I can't believe you didn't take him. Actually, <laughs> yeah, either. Oh, some things that haunt you forever. <laughs> there's a there's a discussion going on right now. You really tried to work the referees in those days, and they come over and talk to you too. So. It looks like you're actually talking to each other. I know. Not I'm not doing it. Yeah. Each other. I see Wall was just coming in the picture there too. So. Did they call it no goal or what were, what were they doing there? I think it was no goal. Yeah. No goal, yeah. See, look at it. it should have counted. But I don't think I won. <laughs> Coach, you were intimidating back then, man. We were scared to death of you. You know what? Someday before I die, 
I think one of the questions I'd love to have answered is what kind of coach was I? You know what I mean? Because you don't know. I mean, you think you know. Yeah. And you don't want to find out, you know, but you wonder, number one, what was I like? Number two, could I coach today versus then? You know, could you? Could a style of they then work now? You know what I mean. But uh, yeah, I think I was. I would say I was probably intense. Oh, you were just, way, you know. Oh, you were a great, great coach, coach. One of the best I've ever had. I'll tell you that much. So, well, I appreciate that, Dallas. You've had some good ones. You can a hundred good ones. I've, I've had lots of bad ones, but I but I could say I got I've had a few good ones too. So, but. You're demanding. That's all you can ask. You expected a lot. That's what, yeah. that's what I think everybody yeah. respected about you. Is you expected a lot, and, and you gave effort, and you tried, and you did your best, and you did what you were told, and usually you had good results. And I know I drove Scott. I drove Scott crazy. To this, to this day, Beatles constantly remind me how much I used to be on him. I think the players probably that I was easiest on were the ones who I felt were playing to their potential, you know, and, and I always, I always had this great belief that I could recognize how far somebody could get. And I had a constant drive in me to help that player get to that level. You know what I mean? And I don't think everybody always agreed with it, but that's, that's, right. I think that was kind of my approach. Well, I think I think from my perspective is uh, I was maybe different than others, but I mean I think you, you demanded that. For me, the way I got out of it, you demanded that you became more of a two hundred foot player. You just weren't one dimensional, and I mean I think you look at our team. You had any guys in any particular time that you could throw out there to take a face off. You know, you had Beats and Booth and Pods and Dino. Yeah, just an assortment of guys. So you know, you just demanded that you play a two hundred foot game. And I think that's what players. Are, Today, you know, you can't really play anymore if you can't play a 200 foot game. You can't be one dimensional. We had a lot of guys like that. So, if anything, you told me, you taught, I'd say to a lot of people, you taught me where my own end was. It took me a while, but it took him to tear his heart on you, but you showed me where my own end was. And that's what eventually got me to the next level. It's not what I did offensively, it's what I did the, in the other end of the ice. So, You guys bring up and uh, touch on a couple interesting things here. For maybe those who are a little younger watching along don't remember how the game was back then, so to speak. How do you think that college hockey and even hockey as a whole really has changed since the early 90s? Now is it's, we're in 2020. It's been 30 years almost since. How do you think it's different? I don't think – I think one of the things today uh, – I talk to Grant about this all the time, a couple of things is college hockey has turned into a kind of game possession in the zone type of game. It drives me crazy. Like everything seems to be a long first pass, a tip to the goal line, and then, you know, race after it. And then the other team does the same thing. I think as you watch this game, number one, you just see a lot of puck possession. You see a lot of attacks with passing options. And, and I think the unfortunate part of the game today at times is you get the puck somewhere in the neutral zone with nobody coming with you with speed that you can give the puck to, and it ends up going just being dumped down to a goal line. And I, I personally, I'd like to see the game go back to where players came back more in the zone. They came up more with the puck as opposed to receiving it while they're already skating backwards in the neutral zone, that type of thing. And I think, in, but you're watching here now, two very elite teams who are very confident with the puck and they want the puck and they want to keep the puck. And, uh, I'd like to see more possession. You know, it's funny, Dally. Uh, when uh, I first started working with Chicago, Marion Hosa was still playing and he was a great fan of the game of hockey and he liked college hockey, but he, he said to me a couple of times, he said, it's, they try to play too fast. He, he said, I, they go up and down and they try to just play too fast. And, they got to play more with the puck. And I think that's a lot of what the game is today. Yeah, you know, my, I love how the game's played today because the speed and the skill set is obviously off the charts. Um, one thing I will say is back then, the game was just more east-west. 
mean, rather than just north, south, go, 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 there was a lot of east, west. Um, yes. And saying that, I know the red lines has a big factor in that. But back then when you couldn't, you know, go back to your own dots and fire to your far blue line and just tip it by them and go again, it's just not – the game back then was more, you know, playing board to board and making plays in the neutral zone rather than just firing it to the blue line and chipping it in. And it's not to say one's better than the other. It's just the game's different now. And um, from a speed standpoint now, obviously, the way kids can skate and play and do things with the puck, it's, it's pretty fun. And it'd be, it'd be kind of neat to see them go back, take the skill today, and, and then all of a sudden have them go back where they got to go east-west because <laughs> you'd really see some guys be able to do some funny things with the puck. And, um, but that, that's my opinion. I mean, I just, it's not, not better, not worse. It's just different. And, uh, but that's, in my opinion, that's the difference a little bit. You know, you look back even in the early nineties in the NHL when the red line was there and guys was getting 200 points a year. I mean, I mean, there was, there was a lot East West then. So it's my opinion. Yeah, no, I think it's true. I think it's true. You know, I think one of the great challenges for coaches today is how do you get shots on goal? I mean, how do you, how do guys get scoring opportunities? Yeah. Every, everybody blocks shots. Everybody, it's like you get a puck in the blue line and there's a, just a, a herd of, you know, nine other players that are in the shooting lane. And it's just so difficult to yeah. get good scoring opportunities. And you, you don't see as many two on ones and three on twos, you know, good or bad, I guess, you know. And, and so the, the offensive game's a real challenge today. I, mean, I admire the coaches who can come out with four yeah. or five goals a night. Back in our day, we there was a herd of players trying to get out of the way, coach, not get in the way. We were we couldn't we were pushing each other trying to get out of the way. So that's the difference now. Guys, everybody who's willing to block shots now, it's crazy. I think that's such an interesting comment about the red line. Because uh I mean, really, like if you asked me what the systems were when I played college hockey, I can't tell you I would know. Um I just think we played. I mean, it had some resemblance, but like, if you think now about, you know, the one, three, one or the, whatever the neutral zone is or whatever, like if there was, I don't feel like you saw like Jersey kind of brought the trap in and whatever that was in the nineties, Dallas, you would know better. Um, Cause you're in the NHL at this point, but or, or Rick, but like not, not having a red line. I've never thought about that. You know how much now you can just, you just advance it North. You know, when there's a red line, you had to come to, to the puck. That it would be, like we we got this drill we call Barcelona, where you just like you watch soccer players kick the ball around. They just they all come to it and they kick it, boom, boom, boom. Um, that's such a good point because you had to stay on side. You just you couldn't do it, and I never thought about that. And um, it'd be interesting to try practice that way, just you know, to put in a hey, no two line pass, and and see what it did to your practice. Yeah, you definitely got to make more than one pass, right? So you just can't fire it and the way it goes. So different game, you know, like I said, it's not, not, not one's better than the other, but you, know, you go back to New Jersey and how they kind of changed. I mean, I'll just, I'll never forget that when they, you know, I, it was, I, I tell people all the time, I played in like three different eras in my NHL career. I played in early nineties when Mario was getting 190 points and Stevie Eisman was getting 60 goals. Then New Jersey from 99 to early 2000s, it was the exact opposite. And then at the end of my career, I started to come back and you know, get guys again getting 100 points and 50 goals. So it was kind of uh, everything came back to where it was in the beginning, obviously not to the extent it was back then, but it, uh, it's funny how that uh, all came back full, back to where it was. Yeah, I always felt, Grant, and I think I still do, that players who have speed maintain that speed. And so I think today's game, it's like the puck creates speed a lot, you know, and I, I guess I, th I still think without a red line, you could still come back more to the puck. You and I have talked about, about this, creating, you know, a lateral pass to create a second pass and, you know, that type of thing. And, you know, I, I just think if the effort was made to create options for in place. I, I think would be good. For, I think it'd be good for the game. And I think players, I agree totally. Maybe, maybe one of the difference in lineups today, there was more of a separation 20 years ago on a team where 
you, you, you could really distinguish the top five or six players to say the bottom five or six players. Now, I think there's very little difference in, in you know, from one through 19 or one through 18, because everybody can skate. Everybody kind of handles the puck. Everybody has the ability, but I think the style of the game itself, you know, just creates this emphasis on creating speed as opposed to possession. It, it, I hundred percent agree. It's actually Joe and I have actually talked about this about, you know, I think from your end to the offensive top of the circle, there's probably a lot of similarities. The guys that are elite from the top of the circle in, um, that's where you see their their skill and their ability to make a play and, you know, some of those things. Because there's like anybody you play, there's guys on their team that if you don't play them right, they have enough speed and skill to get to the top of the circle. It's like, what do they do from that point? But I agree 100%. I mean, there was such a difference. There was, you know, checkers and there was scorers and there were – you know, grinders and, you know, now everybody can skate. Yeah. But here, here's the other thing though, that I will say, um, just my own thought and, you know, like I see, you see a lot of like the, the training in the summer, some of these, you know, there's so many, you know, really amazing talented guys that, that teach, stick handling or skating or, and, and a lot of it's, it ends up being stick handling and stuff like that. Um, there's so many players that are so talented um, with the puck, but sometimes you lose like, like the stuff that maybe would be um, effective in a game based on hockey sense and feel and team and, and things like that. I think you, you could lose some of that where here I feel like, you know, and maybe I'm completely wrong, but like, you know, hockey sense was, was such an important thing and you had to have your head up and, you know, it's, it's, it's different today when you talk about the differences, like, like you've seen us play Hank Sorensen. Like, could you imagine some of the hits Hank could have thrown back that, you know, before, like they were calling me, like he can't even check now. And if you got hit like that, then you'd come to the bench and your coach wouldn't be yelling at the ref. He'd be telling you, get your head up, like hold on to your stick or, you know, is your stick would be 25 feet that way. Um, you know, I wonder a little bit about that, even though the, they're much better, um, their skills are much better, you know, does it always make you a better player? That makes sense. Yeah. You know, like you say, sorry, I watched Sorensen play and I thought, God, you know, if he gets his head on right, you know, he, he, there's a kid who's got talent. He's gay, he's got skills and, you know, then, you know, you can't be one dimensional. You can't just be a player who looks to get big hits because players, you know, the, the higher you go, the less opportunity there is for that. You know, and, and so any big hit nowadays is a penalty for sure. That's why I think possession being brought into the game is so critical because it, there was a time for sure in Dally where we would stress hits. You had to, you know, hit the passer, hit the passer, hit the passer. Now it's not that. It's, it's trying to push the puck to an area and, you know, if you, if you do get a big hit, the guy falls down and it's a penalty. So you, you know, there's no sense, you know, trying to hit too much. Yeah. I just think the emphasis on today's game is, is obviously speed and, and rightfully so. Um, but I also think if you look at it from a top to bottom standpoint, the players on your team, every, everyone, everyone can skate now, right? Like you're a bad skater. You're still an above average skater 15 years ago. Um, so every kid or every player at every level, they can all, I mean, with the exception of maybe what they, they, they can skate. And I think possession is a hockey sense. I mean, if you, you know, um, if you jump it in, the players that come up with the puck are the ones that are reading the play are going to get it. I mean, <laughs> so, um, it's not saying that, you know, you're going to get a puck and you can read it better than somebody else. You're going to get it before they do. So that's hockey sense in itself. And I think that's what, you know, the game back then was a little bit different was, or especially the way we played and we possessed the puck a lot and we had a lot of pretty high hockey, high IQ hockey players. And I don't, people say you can't teach hockey sense. I, 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 I agree with that to a point. I mean, I think you can help it in a lot of different ways. Uh, and I think some players, once they interpret it a few times here and there, it helps them maybe make different decisions. 
Um, that's my view on that because I've heard a lot of people say you can't teach hockey sense. And I, and I, I, I completely agree at the higher levels. You can't, um, but you can definitely help players and give them ideas of what to do. And I've, I've seen players adopt from, adapt from there and be able to make better decisions from that. So, and I think puck possession is a hockey sense. It's, it's where, just where you are on the ice is determines how much you have the puck in your stick. You know, I always felt too that you should you should always try to make something good happen with it. But at the same time, a skill you had to have was to recognize when there was no chance to make a good play. Yeah. And then you had to just check it off to a non-dangerous area. You know what I mean? And I think what coaches so many times are afraid of is a player trying to do too much with the puck, losing it while another team can just pick it up and attack. You know, and, and so I think, you know. That's where Dally, I agree totally. I think repetition, you know, if, if it's taught over and over and over again and practiced, it does become, kids are so talented and so sharp, they can pick anything up yeah. in time. It just, I think you got to be exposed to it enough. And that's where I'd be the value of practice in college. I think you can create repetition with a variety on a certain skill package, including the mental side of the game. I thought the pro, Pro side, I don't think it does because I think you're like Mab Mike Babcock would say over and over. I, I don't want to teach anybody anything. I, don't, I want players ready to come in here and play, and they're right. But I don't. They just play. I mean, we talk about systems, not skills. You know that type of thing. But I think the college coach still has the ability to take a product that's not a finished product and make it a better product. That's such an important role when you talk about college coaches because obviously everybody wants to win and at the end of the day you're judged by your wins and your championships and all that but so much of being a coach especially at the collegiate level is still developing talent and then also character in knowing that a lot of guys are going to go on to do other things at their point uh, different points in life as they actually become mature adults upon graduation and there's a really fine balance to to develop to getting the wins but then also just developing character and helping guide these uh, young men who are coming in at 16, 17 years old into adults also, right? Yeah, for sure. That's it. it it's, it's, um, it's really important. I think um, even to be honest, like now there may be, you, you coach the game a little bit differently. And I think I have a, maybe a, a small advantage just, because I've never known it any other way. Um, but like you asked, you talked about, um, you know, Jim Hiller asking, you know, Hey, why are we doing this or, or whatever? Um, yeah, I think there's more of that today, but I, I think it's not out of, um, you know, ideas, disrespects the wrong word, but it's not out of not wanting to do it. I just think that they're, they're such smarter players. And even when I played in general, that if you, if you say, here's why we're doing it, like they go, oh yeah, okay, that makes sense, and then you're done with it. Then it's they, you, you've explained it and you moved on. And um, I think you know, coaching and, and talking about developing people, it's it's just such an important thing that to, to coach them as people and not just coach them as players. Yeah, totally. I mean, you might have got the end of that a little bit, coach. Where did you did you see a difference in the way you had to coach players? towards the end of your career than maybe you did at the beginning of your career? For sure, for sure. You know, I, I think what has evolved in the game, which has made it harder for players, I think there was a time, you know, and Dally will have his own thoughts on this, where players came to you and they were still kind of an unfinished product. And uh, you were their next person in hockey who they would be anxious to learn from and listen to and had to make sense, but you would learn to. And I think as I got towards the end of my career, it became more and more dominant. A player came in with, all, with an agent already, with the, you know advisors, with agents, you know, and they believed they'd already they'd already been drafted or they'd already you know it was already predetermined what their next step was. It was just a question of how quickly they would leave you to go to that next step, as opposed to coming into a situation knowing that if they worked hard and paid a price and got better, there would be another opportunity, hopefully. And so I think that was the big difference. I think it, you know, you weren't just dealing, like I think there was a time when, you know, a 
player reacted to a coach, good, bad, and indifferent after a game. And those coaches were had held great meaning. Nowadays, I think, and went towards the end of my career, I think it was, there was a coach, he had a reaction. And then the player left the locker room to be met by family agents, representatives who would feed that player what that player wanted to hear or what that agent yeah. wanted to know. So I don't, I think it's, that part of it is different. I'm not, I don't think totally good in the development scheme of players. Cause I think, I think good players want to become great players. And so they have a burning desire to get better. But I think some players are lost, you know, in that transition. Yeah, I, you know, emphasize what coach says there is about development. I think that's by far, in my opinion, the advantage that co college hockey has over, you know, Major juniors, obviously a fabulous league, but they they approach things a little bit differently. And um, you know, college hockey, from a player standpoint, it's it's all the same. And as far as where those kids all want to get, um, every kid who you grant, every kid you get, you know, probably has aspirations of playing at the next level, which they should. Um, but I think the development part is, you know, I try to tell kids all the time: you need to be a sponge for the good and for the bad. There's a lot of coaches that I disliked when I played for. I disliked a lot. But after I left them, I kind of figured out what they were trying to tell me. You know, I, I regretted that in a lot of different ways. So um, I, college hockey is the prime example of you get to practice four days a week and you get to work on the good, the bad, and the ugly, if you want to call it that way. So what, what you want to get better at, what you're already good at. And, you know, so that's, that's my appreciation from going back to my days when I played at Northern is I, I, all I cared about when I got to college was scoring goals and getting points. I mean, it was, I was, I don't want to call myself selfish. I don't think I was selfish, but I, I coach taught me how to, you know, I, I was fortunate to play behind Dean Antos for three years and you realize what you had to do to be successful. So um, that's the benefit of college hockey in my opinion over, everything else and you know, I tell you what like you gotta you know, Joe I know you're on there so just be the biggest sponge you can possibly be whether you like it you hate it or you love it I mean you have to learn from it and um, you know you'll be a better person and a player for that I agree yeah like that was one thing <clears throat> with coach like coming in being a centerman especially um, playing against guys that are 22 23 it was a it was a tough adjustment adjustment at the beginning um but that's something that I mean we've had multiple talks about and something that I've worked on and it's great because you have four years to work on kind of stuff like that and you were talking about it earlier 200 foot games so I think just being like an all-around player at this point is, is the most beneficial thing moving forward yeah it is for sure I'll tell you one thing Dallas great you know, all the players I've coached over all those years, 39 years, he, there was a stretch where Dallas I was, I was the best player I'd had in those 39 years. He was by far the best player in the country because he made himself into that total all-around player. Well, it's not just words coming out of his mouth. He made it. He had a burning desire. He had a crazy temper, you know, but, you know, he, he had great emotion. But, but the ultimate goal was always the same. And it was that passion that drove him through us to lead us to the National Hockey League, and it can all be done. You know, I, I watched number 18 play with the Wildcats. He, he can be a really, really good player. I think he can be a much more complete player than he is right now, but he can, he can be a really, really good player. You know, and, you know one point I, I guess I want to make too that uh, the college game, you asked me why, what's different today than, you know, it used to be saying this. I, I think the tragic thing that's happened to college hockey is the lack of emotion that's in the game now. I think I think rules can either help or hurt. I, I think this incessant timeout, stoppages in play, and video reviews, and play, coaches talking to referees—it's just one stoppage after another. There's no sustained play. There are still bands in building, but the crowds are never in the game because the game always stops. You know, it just doesn't keep going and hype people up. And I got in this this year, especially in the years around Dallas. The motion in the building was just insane. And you go to North Dakota and it was insane. You go to Minnesota, it was insane. You go to Wisconsin with that band right on the glass. And 
now I go in all these rinks and it's just quiet. You know, I think it's a tragic loss. And I think the game would help itself if they would just get back to more sustained play, you know, and less being sure I'm right as a referee and less being sure, you know, a puck went across the goal line. And you know what I mean? The game took care of itself in those, in those days. I mean, ultimately goals counted and teams won and lost and, you know, the crowd left the building feeling that they had a great experience and could hardly wait, you know, for seven o'clock the next night to get back to the rink. And I, I think we've lost that in college hockey. There's games that, you know, especially in the second period where we're really playing well and the crowd's into it and we're coming and, you know, like you're sitting there going like, don't let the clock sit. Because you know TV and you're almost like, I hope we get another one before we get to the TV because you know exactly when they're coming right. and you're hundred percent right. There's, there's times that you, you lose a little momentum and you got to, and you obviously got to be tough enough to get it back mentally to, to go right back at them and get it right back. But I mean, that, that's a tough, you know, when the crowd's into it and you know, you're playing well at home, that's a tough environment for somebody, you know, to, to get out of it, you know, now they can almost get a reprieve a little bit with the, with the TV timeout and um, you know, you, it, there's times that you're really hoping that you can, you know, kind of bust through before you get that other time out. Yeah. I'd love to see it. I, to see it. I was muted there, but not trying to um, compare. Obviously you can't compare the 1990s to 2020s. It's just, it's, very hard to compare any of that kind of stuff, but you know, you you think about, you know, if I watch this game, if I if I if you if you were to plug this game in and watch it and 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 not know much about when this game took place, I mean, it's a pretty fast game. If you go back to the, there's a lot of fast players out there. Is, is the game played differently? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's a lot of hooking, there's a lot of holding, there's a lot going on. Grant, you played a little bit later than me. It's it's, it's, you know, college hockey going back to whenever you want to go back to it, it's always been a very fast paced game. Um, regardless of if it was in the eighties, nineties compared to other leagues, it's been always been a skating game. So I, I think college hockey in itself is, you know, moving in a better place. I, I don't love, I don't love the Olympic size sheets. Um, I, I'd like to see them smaller. Um, and that's not because I was slow. <laughs> it's just because uh, I just think it makes for a more entertaining game. Uh, I think everyone's goal is eventually get to the next level, which is an NHL style sheet. I think we should, I don't know why we'd have some rinks being an Olympic style and some NHL. So I think it, it really feeds into how the game is played, regardless of if you're a high speed team or a non high speed team, you, if, if you're playing in a smaller rank and you're fast, it's still going to be exciting as, as you're playing in an Olympic rank. Um, I, I just think from a college standpoint, I'd love to see them go back in that direction. I know you can't just take your rank and rebuild it and make it smaller. But that's one of my, my biggest, not pet peeve is that I'd like to see them go back to a normal size rank. So. You can do it. I mean, Mankato did it. Yeah. You know, I mean, it can be done. It takes yeah. an efficient to do it. But I agree. I agree. I think it's a better game with, you know, smaller issues. So. That was when a lot of college players were going to the Olympics, right, Coach? That's why there was that that push in the kind of the 90s, a lot of rinks that were built. A lot of them seemed to go NHL or Olympic yeah. size. It was a USA hockey move, for sure. You know, the Olympic factor, the European factor, the skill factor, trying to create more space, less contact more possession, you know, that type of thing. They did all that. They did all that, Coach. They created more space and no contact. So there it goes on the other side out there. <laughs> and referees have taken contact out of that. I mean, I, I've never been – I have a lot of friends who are referees, but, uh, you know, referees throw me crazy. I mean, to me, a, a good hit today should be no different than a good hit back in 1991. You know, why, why there's a penalty if somebody, you know, doesn't get up after a hit is beyond me. I mean, you know, the, the contact of the head, I understand that. I understand, I understand everything. I just think they, there should be more contact allowed. I think it's just better for the player, better for the game, better for everybody, but there's not. 
And when there was a red line in, I honestly don't, and you could, you could get in people's way a little bit. You didn't see the dangerous hits on the defenseman, you know, because yeah. they, you know, their partner would get in your way if you're trying to forecheck and, you know, you, you'd still get by them and angle them. But, um, you know, I, I think that probably, you know, with the, you know, the elimination of the red line has had made it a little bit um, more dangerous for defensemen um, that way, you know, and I think that might have started the, the, you know, the trend. And then you talked about it, the, the replays, like if you watch anything in slow motion, it, it looks anything, you slow it down, it looks like, ooh, I don't, you know, I'm not sure about that. So um, I, I agree on that. Like you should see it live. And if it, if you feel like it's a penalty live, it's a penalty. Now, you know, maybe goals you might want to look at or, or whatever, but like to stop it every two seconds to check if it hits a penalty or not, like you just saw it, you know, you, you it's not like you guys missed it. So just, you know, give the refs the ability and the power to, to, you know, be able to make a, you know, so-called mistake or two. Um, but to, to keep the game going, like there's a reason you're a college ref is because everybody thinks you're pretty good, you know, and, and go ahead and, and go with your, what your gut is. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, the game is like, you know, as much as you've heard it, heard it said, it's a game of mistakes, right? Who makes the most, who makes the least and who adjusts from it. Um, it's funny you say that, Grant, is when you said you make it hard on your defenseman, it was just, I remember when the, I was in St. Louis and the, and the NHL, they changed that rule as you can't hook, you can't hold, you can't hold players up. That was like game on for defensemen getting hurt, right? Like, and, and as a player at my stage of my career, I was like, oh my God, this is like the greatest rule in the history of rules. I'm allowed to just run somebody. They can't touch me. And this is great. And so, but what happened was, well, yeah, you're taking penalties, you're hitting kids from behind, you're hit. So <clears throat> I think they, they obviously figured that out pretty quickly that that wasn't going to work very well, but you're, you're absolutely right. You're, you're, you know, rule changes, regardless of what that rule might be. If you go back, you know, I, I love watching going, going back to the old days and watching the Oilers play the Calgary flames and those old those hockey games, every now and then you'll catch one on NHL network. And just, that's, that's pretty darn good hockey. And if you look at the Edmonton Oilers team back then, it wasn't really that slow. <laughs> They had Glenn Anderson and Gretzky and Messier. I mean, yeah, they had good players, but they, they played the game at a, and it's Calgary in the same time. They played the game at a different level than everybody else. They played fast. They played like how teams want to play now, except they played physical. They, there was no red line. Obviously they played fast. So if you took, I, if you took that 1980 Oilers team and moved them to today's game, uh, that they'd be able to play with anybody because they'd be able to adjust. I think players can adjust and make adjustments, whether it's physical or not physical and fast. I said earlier, I think everyone can skate now. I mean, you can skate whether they can think like everybody else, but everyone can move. So the game's always going to be fast from here moving forward. It's how you make those adjustments to help kids out to make decisions. And um, that's, that's just the way the game is going. That's directions ahead of before, before you remember when you spoke to our team, Dallas, was that two years ago? Yep. Yep. Um, that, that was awesome. Um, I was awesome. so nervous when I had that speech, just so you know, I was so nervous. I'm so bad oh, at like that. Oh, you weren't. For real? Yeah, I hate doing speeches, man. I'm not a speaker, but I, I appreciate it. I love doing it. I just not very good at it. Well, thank you for doing that then. Um, but, and I don't can't remember if I showed you guys this, Joe, but like, I was trying to like, give give all the players just a, a glimpse of like okay this is who this guy i mean obviously they they know you're you know arguably the greatest players ever played at northern um but and for sure the most nhl success stanley cup champion all those things so i want to just give them like a visual of um who you were as a player so and i think i showed you guys joe if not we just watched this coaches but like it, this highlight video must have been the day after they took the red line out because you are just blasting guys, like just blasting guys. And it's like, dude, I show that Joe. Uh, I don't know if you did to us, that might've been just the coaches. Um, but it was just like, Ooh, I mean, I'm surprised you didn't get hurt more. That was <laughs> kamikaze ish. Well, they, 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 yeah, I got hurt a lot of those. So they probably didn't show the other half of those, but 
Um, I, I, you know, like I said, I mean, go, going back to my college career, I mean, I had to make a huge adjustments. I, I've said this to a lot of people is when I left Northern and I went to the Detroit Red Wings camp, my first year, their centermen were Steve Eisenman, Sergey Fedorov, and Jimmy Carson. And I was playing center. And I was like, oh, that's not really giving me a lot, a lot of spots to play in. So, you know, I, I wasn't scared to bump around a little bit. So I was, you know, I had a good senior year. So I, I, I really, I really I made my decision in training camp or my rookie camp in Detroit is that I have to really do something a little bit different that this team might need. So I, I kind of just kind of started running around a little bit. I mean, I didn't, I didn't do it cause I really wanted to, I did it cause I out of, out of necessity, out of need for myself. And you can call that selfish, I guess. I was trying to make it to the next level and, and I kind of found my way in that direction. And, um, you know, and, and I tell kids all the time, I mean, you have to be able to have, be able to fall back on something. And, you know, I fell back on what coach Conley and coach Kyle taught me how to play defense, um, kill penalties, block shots, what it, what it was like to be a good teammate. So, um, I learned a lot my junior and senior year, especially on how, what it takes to, to get to the next level just by, what I experienced over those two years. So I, um, and saying, saying all that, I mean, like I made it the next level, but I didn't make the next level because I scored, I had a good senior year where I scored lots of goals and things went well and we lost at the end, which was terrible. But um, I made it the next level because of what they taught me how to play as a 200 foot player. So um, that's, that's the reason I had the success I had. I mean, and I had to be that player for a long time whether, and I, and I accepted that and I respected the fact that I, I wasn't good enough. I, and that's bad, but I wasn't good enough to be the player I thought I was when I got to my first training camp. I realized really quick, I wasn't even close to being the player I thought I could, had to be. So I had to make adjustments and I made adjustments and I accepted that and I was able to play. So, and that was a lot of fun. <laughs> Well, how many even like over the last 10 years, how many college players, you could probably count them on, you know, two hands that went from college to the NHL that were, you know, one of the top 60 centers in the world or whatever, the, you know what I mean? Whatever the number is like so few guys and it's the guys that end up, you know, making it like, like, like your career, Dallas, like some of the guys now, even if you look at their junior stats, yeah. you, you'd just be blown away. Like, whoa, or college stats, like, you know, whatever, you'd be like, that right. guy would, you know, 200 point score in college. Like, you know, you just change your game. Yeah. It's, it's, and I, and I try to tell kids all this time, you have to be, there's a lot of different ways to skin a cat. I mean, you have to determine, obviously, wherever you go, coach, you scout junior players. And I'm sure you see those juniors move to college and you probably go watch those kids and see how they, they transfer from one, one environment to the other. And um, I'm sure one of the, you know, for me, when I watch a kid that does really has a whole bunch of success at one level, when they go to the next level, I, I'm, I'm looking for that same success. Well, yeah, I am. I mean, yeah, I'm sure you do have to look for that, but I'm also looking for kids that are willing to make changes and why are they making those changes? And if they're making those changes for the right reason, um, you know, it's, there's so many different ways to have success at the next level. Um, and Joe, this is probably for you. If you want to play at the next level, which I hope you do, I'm sure you do, um, is that you have to be able to play in every aspect of the game when the puck is dropped. And I'm saying that when the puck is, when it's two minutes left in the game and you're down five, three, you, you want to be the player that wants to be on the ice. And you're, you're hoping that your coach feels the same way. Um, because there's lots of different ways to make a, to have a career at this, whether it's at the NHL, the AHL, Europe, um, but you have to be able to do things that other players aren't willing to do. And if you're willing to do that, everyone has a chance. You just have to accept the fact that I might not be good enough to score 30 goals, <laughs> okay? which is okay because 90% of Americans don't can't score 30 goals, uh, but, you, but I'm willing to block a shot, kill a penalty, um, sit on the bench and cheer my teammates on. And if you can do that and be a good teammate, 
you have a future in playing at different levels. 100% agree with that, yeah. I mean, you gain your trust of your, of your coach too. And then if he can trust you in those positions and you're obviously going to get that playing time, you know, a lot of guys are, they can put up a lot of goals, but coach necessarily won't trust them to put them on the PK or take a face off with two minutes left. So you can be that guy at such a valuable position that, that you can be. Exactly. Folks, if you're just tuning in, we're watching the 1991 NCAA Hockey Championship between NMU and Boston University. I'm Derek Maselli. We've got current NMU head coach Grant Patoni. You just heard a current Wildcat Joe Nardi talking also. We're joined by former Wildcat Dallas Drake, former head coach and athletic director Rick Comley. And if we zoom back in on this game a little bit, just to keep up with what's going on in game here, I think we're are we at the point where it's 6-3 yet. I think it might still be 5-3 here as we're still very early on in the third period. But how does it feel out on the ice right now? This is one of the games, I mean, you look back, such crazy swings and momentum where they're up 3 to nothing after the first period, then you score five in the second, which I don't know if I've ever seen five goals scored in a period like that. And then as we just saw the score there, 5-3 still early on here in the third period. I imagine those first couple goals you scored after you were down three, nothing was when well, you felt, Oh, maybe they were getting a little lax or whatever, but then to score five like that and be up here. And I think we're about to score this um, sixth one right now. Right there, yeah. I think that's it right there to go up six, three. What does it feel like out there? And c- can you sense from them frustration or w- what does it feel like out on the ice in this moment is now you're up six, three in the third. Well, apparently we felt a little too much because we, uh, <laughs> we let them back in the hockey game. So obviously with us, when in that situation, we were, you know, exuding confidence because, you know, there's not many teams throughout that year that when we were up six, three, they came back on us. I mean, you know, so like we were obviously a team that thought that maybe we, we obviously let off the gas a little mm-hmm. bit that led the team back in the hockey team. But to tell you the feeling right now, well, the feeling is obviously, yeah, where this game's almost over. Um, if you're looking back on it then, but obviously it wasn't. You know what's amazing watching at Dew Dally is how many saves both goalies make standing up. <laughs> yeah. you know, I mean, nowadays, the goalie doesn't make a save standing up. <laughs> Very true. Very true. And the other thing that strikes me, even watching it again, boy, it's just up and down. There's really not a lot of hooking, holding. Right. You know, I mean, it, like you said, pace, tempo, skill, it's it's up and down the ice constantly. Hey, Coach, it's funny when you're talking about that, the stretching, the zone and all that kind of stuff. It's like, like you walk, like we'll watch our games. It's never the first pass. It's always the second pass that springs the guys somewhere. So like, it's fun for me to watch this. I haven't watched it in quite some time is first pass is usually a stationary. You know, we're going to make the pass because we want to. And the second pass is usually the one where the guy's flying through the neutral zone. Well, today's game. And it's, it's like, we went back to, it's like you stretch the zone, you stretch the neutral zone as fastly and quickly as you can. Um, Cause you're trying to get the puck out there. See there's one pass and then, well, that didn't work there, but it's usually that second pass that springs somebody, and that's the difference in my in the East West yeah. stuff that we were talking about. You know what you can really see in this game is the confidence the players have. Yeah, you know, just the, you can just tell every time they touch a puck, it's like they're going to make something happen. Hey, you don't see you don't see anybody. Um, I mean, a couple times, like, you know, guys have put, you know, pucks into areas and, and to where they hope they can get it again. But, like, you don't see much of that. Like, like you see guys trying to make hockey plays. Right. With support. They, seem, they always seem to be supported, too. Yeah, I know we're talking about, you know, a championship game and everything's on the line and two best teams in the country. And, you know, but they're playing. They definitely are playing, and there's a style, not not a system. Eh? Like you said, you made the comment earlier. I mean, one three, one two three, whatever it might be. Everybody's just playing. 
Okay, they're playing to get the puck and they're playing to keep the puck. Yeah, it, does. Yeah. it was a wild game, wasn't it? Up and down. And oh. most, a lot of people still feel it's the best college hockey game ever, simply because of the way it unfolded. I played, coach, I played with uh, Ray Ferrero in St. Louis at the end of Ray's career, and he's obviously a big TSN analyst now. And Ray got traded. He got sat right beside me, and I knew Ray because he grew up in Trail, and I grew up in Rawson, which is six miles apart. And uh, he's like, we just got to talking and got to know each other again. I haven't seen each other in forever. And, and uh, he's like, you know, he goes, I remember when you played on that team in Northern. He goes, I got on a plane, and we – we're watching the game in the locker room and we left and we got back, we landed and it was still on. <laughs> so he yeah. goes, and you guys yeah, ended up watching it the overtime. So it was pretty funny. So, cause I grew up idolizing Ray Ferrero cause he grew up, played for the Portland Winter Hawks and scored a hundred goals in Brandon and was from trail. And I was from Rosslyn. It was, it was kind of funny. So, and then he got traded to St. Louis near the end of his career, and I got a chance to play with him. So it was a big thrill for me. And then he got sat right beside me, which is even better. So um, it's it's pretty funny how that all worked out when he told me that story. So, Well, he was committed to Northern in 1982, but he never got there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he was like a little fe- – he was a phenom when he was younger. Man, he was – well, not younger. He had an unreal NHL career. He was – he was a really good, good player, good person. That was a, that was the phone call I got him on August 16th, telling me that he was not coming and he was going to go play. I thought he, I think he started. Didn't he start in Brandon and then went to Portland, or did he start in Portland? He started in Portland and went to Brandon. Yeah. Yeah. And then he told me he was going to go play major. And no matter what I said or did, I couldn't talk him out of it. What a tragic loss that was. Yeah. Not tragic, but bad loss. <laughs> At the time, it was tragic, I guarantee. I know how that would feel. <laughs> it really was. <clears throat> not only that, but, and that's not nothing to do with this game, but we had just come off playing in the national tournament in uh, Duluth in 1981. And uh, my two returning center room were Steve Bozak and Jeff Pyle. And they both had 90-some points, you know, as uh, juniors. And then Ray Ferraro was my number one recruit. So starting the next fall, 1982, our team down there, you talk about Detroit centermen when you went there, Dally. Our centermen would have been, you know, Steve Bozak with 94 points, Jeff Pyle with 92 points, Ray Ferraro, and then Charlie Lindine, a highly rated player out of the Minnesota high school. That would have been our team to build around. And uh, both Pyle and Bozak turned pro in July. Ray Ferraro went to Major A in August. Uh, <laughs> yeah. That's tragic. <laughs> that was the question I was going to ask you, Grant and Coach. I mean, so when a player, like for example, Ray Farrell calls Coach in August and says, "I'm not coming," like you just go back in your archives and start recruiting kids that may not be there, or do you just say we're just good with what we got? What do you What do you do? It's, it's the middle of August. You're all done. <laughs> yeah. You got money left over and you're done. Yeah. I mean, you know, Dallas, when I got the job, it was, oh, probably it was right after Easter. So, you know, early April. Um, and Walt, Walt had done such a good job. Like all these really good players were committed to Northern, uh, Joel being one of them. And how many, do you remember how many kids were in your class, Joel? There's like five or six. Yeah. Um, so really good players, right? And um, the time from the coaching change to they hired the new coach um, was it was an extended period of time. There was there was you know maybe a month or something, um, and I'm grateful it took that time because I it obviously for me it worked out that I, I got to get the job. Um, but the, all these players kind of like that that's back when there was an early signing period, so there was a, a period that went in November. And then there wasn't a period again until April. So, or, or late March, or it was, I think it was April. So you, if you committed after November 15th, I think the day was, that was the end of the early period. It was like November 5th to the 15th or something. So anybody that committed after that date, you couldn't sign your national letter of intent. So you had verbally committed, but you hadn't, you know, kind of consummated the marriage. 
So when I, I got this job, these guys were still like, they were committed, but they weren't, you know, committed. And, um, you know, they're not sure who the coach is going to be. They committed to Walt, um, you know, lo lots of reasons for a young man to get nervous. And they um, ended up, you know, going to, uh, so one went to St. Cloud, one went to UConn. Um, I think one kid went to Ohio State. Um, so they um, these went to real good programs. So, you know, now all of a sudden, and, and Joe, um, Joe was the only one that, that stuck with us. And, um, you know, Joe, like, Joe. It, it, good job, Joe. Yeah. You know, like, I'm glad I did it. So we, we had one player and, you know, and I'd never seen Joe Nardi. Didn't, I didn't know Joe Nardi. And I, you know, and I'll tell a Joe Nardi story after this. Um, but they're, they're just, you, you go out and you see players and you have all this money, but you know, like, like coach Conley said, you're starting to think, okay, you know, if I give this player a, a full scholarship, um, you know, that's a full scholarship for four years or a half scholarship or, or whatever. And that was in April. So, you know, like we kind of ended up, you know, um, trying to find guys we thought we could grow a little bit and, and some of those things, but um, it's tough. Cause it's, it's so, you know, nowadays with recruiting, like, guys don't miss very often you know they, they might not end up being what you think but with all the video and you know with the ability of these guys um most players are are from kind of the same areas like you don't see a lot of um and, and we try as much as we can to recruit small you know kids that are from you know smaller towns because they seem to fit real good with us but like you know you look at you look across canada like think about how many great saskatchewan players that were playing college hockey um, when you played and even when I did now, you know, major junior does such a good job, you know, taking all the guys from Regina and Saskatoon and some of these places that you don't see them from the smaller towns. Cause it's, you know, a lot of these things have become, you know, training, you know, the, these players get ice all summer and some of these things. And the difference was, you know, like we didn't skate in the summer when we were growing up cause it just, it wasn't ice. So you didn't be in from grand forks or, or, you know, trail, like you weren't, falling behind the kid in Toronto or Minneapolis or Edmonton because they didn't have ice either. So, you know, I feel like we could still find players there. Now a lot of them come from, you know, kind of, um, you know, here, you know, the bigger city areas, metro type areas. And, and that's where you see like non-traditional markets. Like, you know, think about St. Louis. Um, yeah. That was, you know, a hockey hotbed. And the one year that the world junior team that, that we had, we had five or six of those kids on that team. You know, with Matthew was supposed to be on it the one year, Kachuk, and he ended up making Calgary, and we had Brady the next year, but it was five or six of those kids. So you don't miss much. Um, you know, they all come from the same place. So, but um, I got to tell a story about Joe. So I, I'd never seen Joe play. Didn't know anything about him. Because um, I didn't recruit Edmonton. I didn't recruit Alberta. I didn't, you know, didn't recruit any of these places because um, most of the players that I, I kind of focused on in my old job was – um, you know, a lot of Americans and it was kind of like Chicago West, you know, and I might end up going out to, to British Columbia because I, I knew Pentecton a little bit and, you know, just, I did no idea who Joe Nardi was. And the first day of practice, you know, I, I don't even know who any of the returning guys are. Um, he steps on the rink and like, Joe, you were just electric for like the first two weeks. And I'm like, I called Rob and I go, thank you for keeping this Nardi kid. Cause <laughs> He's going to be useful. And, you know, your, your whole freshman year, like you had to play above where, you know, it was probably fair, you know, like a freshman, you want to try hide them a little bit, just if you can, you know, if in a perfect world, you try to play a freshman on the, the third line, especially as a center. Um, so he doesn't have to play against the, you didn't have, you had to play in the top two from day one. And, um, you know, it was, it, you've been such a good player for us and the person and all that stuff. So um, I'm glad you stuck with us Nards. Too. I'm glad I made the decision to stay. I mean, and that year, I mean, playing in that second spot, I mean, at the time I thought, you know, this isn't really helping my game, but now thinking about it, you know, being a, a senior, just to play against those bigger guys, have, that's helped a ton to this point. So I'm kind of glad I was in that spot. It's helped a ton. You've grown a ton too, yeah.
Everybody's talking for three minutes. What's the score now? Are we still? Seven to four. How how do we let them score three goals in the last ten minutes, Coach? I don't know what happened there. It had to be the boards. Had to be the boards. <laughs> I think Billy Pye, I felt, in the third period, was the unluckiest goal. His pucks went in all crazy ways. Yeah. You know, just up in the air over him and in. And then he makes a save with two seconds to go. Yes. You know, it might have been the best save in program history. Yeah. Tony Martin roaring down at you with two seconds yeah. to go. We just, gave, we just gave the best player on their team a breakaway with 10 seconds left. And we were <laughs> how that happened is still coach. I still watch that back. I'm like, oh my gosh, how did that happen? Exactly. Me too. But I will say, coach, I think you or somebody said earlier, possibly about one of the greatest college games, you know, in the final. You think about the NCAA finals. I mean, it's there's not a lot of games if you want to go back in the archives that are <laughs> a game that way it started and finished like this one did. I mean, right. three nothing, we come back, they come back, goes to overtime three times. So it was, it's a good hockey game. Did they score, they scored to make it six to four and then we, you guys scored to make it seven, four. Yeah. So you suck the momentum right back. So like, you know, you'd almost think now like, okay, they got one, but we got one right back that you, you'd think like, you know, feel pretty good about where you're at. I agree. You know, you never really thought you were in trouble until they score 39 seconds to go to tie it. <laughs> but again, that tells you how much confidence they have. If we're getting this from one side, I'm sure if, if we did a broadcast from BU, you know, with their players and Jack Parker and stuff, you'd, you'd hear many of the same comments about their team. Yeah. yeah there, there's a reason they were where they were, where they were, because and they were a team that I think they lived and died on how they were going to play, um, regardless of what the score was. Um, they were just going to keep coming. And I think we as a team kind of, you know, we sat back a little bit, but I mean, <laughs> Like I said earlier, we were a team that could shut you down when we had to, and we kind of got we got in a little bit of a, a spot there where we thought it's seven to four. This team's not going to come back and score on us. And Billy Pye was a fantastic goaltender, mm -hmm. so I mean, so we we thought we had one of the better goalies in the country, and we had the better offenses in the country, but we just kind of sat back. So, and BU was a team that just was just gonna, they played a certain style; they were just going to go. And regardless of what the score was, they could be losing 6-1 or, or winning 6-1. They were going to try to score as many goals as they can. And uh, that kind of came back at us a little bit. But Yeah, neither team was ever out of it. That's what I heard. Sure. What year was um... – that, that Amani, Kachuk, McEachern line. McEachern was, he was a senior, and Amani and Kachuk were like freshmen and sophomores, younger. They were freshmen. Freshmen. I'm not sure what he was. So that was Amani's 31st as a freshman. He was sure good. If it's coming up, I think the play isn't it, Dallas, where McEachern. I don't know if he beat Brad, went in, took a shot, it hits one post, goes across the goal line, hits the other post, and then Brad came sliding in to knock the puck to the corner. And Coach, they had Scotty Lachance on that team, who was a yep. first round pick. Uh, they had Ed Ronan, who played in Montreal for a number of years. They had like five guys that played in the NHL, not shortly after this team. I mean, they were <laughs> they had a lot of really good players. Um, and big strong team too I mean they were skilled but they were strong there we go right there there we go <laughs> ended up marrying the coach's daughter he married Jackie's daughter yeah yeah no kidding <laughs> How was that Dallas playing in front of that many fans? 
I mean, it was, it was, it was, it was awesome because, you know, we were, we were, you know, you played there in Northern. So we had, you know, obviously know the fan base there is a pretty dedicated group. And we, we had a pretty dedicated group that year. I mean, regardless of we were, when we were at home, we had, we had a full house, regardless of we were playing the eighth team in the WCHA. So we had a lot of people travel down there and it was, it was a, a weekend where there was a lot of snow and rain and stuff. So it was, it was pretty for us to be there. Our band was there. It was, it was an experience of a lifetime. I mean, like I said, I mean, I, I go, those are memories that I'll have forever, but our fan, the fan base at Marquette, when you're winning and doing well and doing the things the right way, and they'll be there to support you. Um, they love their hockey up there. As you know, um, you just have to, if you compete hard and work hard and do what they want, <laughs> do what your coach is asking you to do, I guess, and win some hockey games, you're gonna always going to have a fan base there. So it's pretty special. I mean, playing in front of a, a fan base like that in a national championship game and, you know, the way the game ended up, we'll just kind of delete that picture right there. But it was, it was a lot of fun. That's what I'm saying. It kind of just goes in. It never just goes in. It, <laughs> that was a pretty 25 foot wrist shot that you know blew by the goalie. Yeah. But there's McEachern again. The crowd had to be cheering for Northern. I mean, they had to be anti BU. I mean, I'm I sure we beat Minnesota in the finals. They might not have been. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I'll ask you, um, I got a chance to meet the Delaney last year when we were in Mankato and they were playing there the same weekend. You lived it as a player. What was it like for you to live it as a father and to know what she was going through, especially in that final game? Well, she didn't play much, but it was okay. I mean, like, like I always tell her, I always try to give my kids the advice is to be a good teammate regardless if you're playing, if you're not playing. And she went through some tough times there in Wisconsin. She didn't play a lot. Um, but, you know, I was, I couldn't be, I couldn't have been more proud of how she handled the situation because they had a very good team. They had a couple of Olympians come back and, they, and she didn't, she literally, I don't know if she got a shift in the national championship game. And so she sat on the bench and cheered her teammates on and, but like I couldn't have been no more. I, I wasn't at the national championship game. My wife went. I did not go. I sat at home watching on TV. I was um, there's a reason I didn't go. I was a little superstitious for a couple of different reasons because I had gone for a game earlier that they didn't win. And so my wife asked me the question: If they go to the national championship next year, are you going to go? I'm like, well, let's we'll answer that question next year. But um, so I, I I I couldn't have been more proud of watching her and, and watching that team play. They, they had a fantastic team and a fantastic year. Abby Rock from Sault Ste. Marie was just an incredible player. She still is. Um, so, um, you know, so it was, it was fun for me to watch her go through. It was, it was fun for me to watch her grow up and play. And I had a chance to coach her for a few years and teach her a few things here and there. And, and, uh, and it was watching her go to Wisconsin and learn from Mark. And there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of things your kids don't understand until they play under somebody that's maybe, maybe they don't understand why they're telling them what they're telling them or why they're not playing, why they're playing. And I try to explain her it's, it's, it's lessons that you have to learn. And, and as hard as it might be, you got to be a good teammate. And so I was extremely proud of how she dealt with it. And that the fact that she won a national championship was, I mean, she couldn't have been more ecstatic about that. And, um, I was couldn't have been happier for it. Yeah, we bumped into them twice in Nashville and Mankato last year. It really was kind of neat to get to talk to her and, and to talk to Abby and uh, really just ter a terrific young lady and a, and, a, and a good group and good good team. Yeah, it, it, it's <laughs> you know everybody has kids that grow up and play and you have different emotions about it and. Um, she, um, she had an opportunity to play for represent the United States and play and won a gold medal in Czech Republic. So I, she's given me a lot of opportunities to go watch her play. And I'm really grateful for that. So for me to go back on my kids, she's really given me a lot, um, just for being able to watch her play and enjoy her having fun and 
So she's given me as much as uh, she's, as, as she's, you know, I've learned, I've appreciated how much she's let me watch her play and have enjoy watching her play. Um, that's as a parent, that's all you can ask for. He had a pretty good chance to be a good athlete though, Dally. You know, <laughs> mom, mom and dad were both good athletes. Uh, Amy was a basketball player at Northern. You'd shoot the lights out. <laughs> she, she was an excellent player. So I went to watch your daughter play one day in Minnesota. You know, we were playing at night and they were playing at four o'clock and <clears throat> I went over and stood up in the railing and you know, watched because Jimmy Rock's daughter was playing too and yours was playing and you guys weren't there, but I got a chance to watch them for two periods. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it, as a, as a parent, like I said, I mean, it, it was, she's given me more thrills just from being able to sit in the stands and watch play. And once, you know, you learn and you, you understand that those, it's few, if you are far between it, you can actually watch your kids play and enjoy it. And it's just, just cherish the moments. And she's got one more year to play here and I'm going to try to do that. The list has got to be short, Dallas. Father and son or daughter with a national championship ring. I can't imagine there's lots of people on that list. <laughs> yeah, probably true. Yeah. Well, lucky, you know, you play with good, you, I always said, you, you're, you're a benefactor of people you're around, people you've uh, had a chance to, you know, for me, coaches that I've had, you're always the benefactor of being around good people. And uh, understandably sometimes you don't realize that at the time um but you look when you get a little bit older like you know we're, i'm getting the, you, you realize how lucky you were to be at the right spot at the right time and i don't say that's luck but you have to appreciate the fact that you played with some good people um you learned a lot and that the fact that the games the game in myself has taught me a lot more just as far as life lessons go um as far as how i approach every day as far as I work out the goals. So it's, 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 it's a funny way sometimes how the games can teach you a lot of things that are, have nothing to do with the game of hockey. hundred percent. Down to crunch time in this game. <laughs> yeah, but they haven't like, it's not like they've been putting it on you. I mean, no, no, no. They've had a they walk-offs and, we had plenty of scoring chances. Look at right here. That coach was I was exactly right too. They did they they the three goals they scored at the end of the game were like like they went end to end with, with, with the exception of Tony with ten seconds left. They just kept plugging and plugging and the puck went in. <clears throat> I don't know how Billy was feeling right now, though. I'm sure maybe, he was probably churning a little bit. <laughs> no, Coach, we had – we had. I know you couldn't come last year, and uh, we had a, all the guys or majority of the guys came down last year. I'd love to do it again sometime, but it, that was a, a lot of fun reminiscing about old times and some of the stories that came up that I didn't have any idea happened. Oh my goodness. It was funny. It was, it was good stories. I'm sure I, there'd be a lot that I wouldn't know about either. Yeah. I didn't know about them either coach. So that tells you how, how secretive they were. <laughs> Cause it was a team who, who played well, who worked hard, but they had fun too. Yeah. There's a penalty today for sure. Any more <laughs> in there? It's just interesting how much the, the game has changed. When you you take a look, I mean, Dally, you were eighty point guy on your defensive player of the year, and we had we had more fifty point guys on that team than you you sometimes see in the whole NCAA now. It's just uh, so much more a wide open game. Well, let's not let's not be mistaken. I wasn't I wasn't a, the guy play my senior year. I had a, a a good offensive year. So I mean, my junior year we had incredible players: Brad and Beats and Jimmy, and we it, it, the list goes on. So my senior year, yeah, things went well. But um, it's the game has changed. I will 
Yeah, it's changed in, in a lot of different ways. Um, but then, like, it's, whether it's good or bad, like, I, I love the game today. I love the speed. I love this. I love the skill set. But back then, like I said earlier, and that it, 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 there's a lot of East West stuff. And I just, I appreciate the extra pass. That's something I've always appreciated. Um, I think the teams that can make the extra pass, I don't mean the extra pass because you have to make it. Teams that make that five foot pass sometimes are the teams that have a lot of success. And it could be at the blue line, it could be in the neutral zone, it could be in their own zone. But you gotta be willing to make the extra pass once in a while. And um, that's, in my opinion, the difference in what the games played, you know, 20 years ago. It is today. Today it's about speed. Back then it was a little bit about East West stuff. Yeah, and the question would be, can it be different? You know what I mean? I, I mean, if you came in and you put, you know, Grant says, okay, I'm going to change everything this year. We're going to become an East West team and not a North South team. Can, can that really be done? Right. It's probably got to be a mix of everything, right? I mean, you can tweak it, you can add, you can change philosophy a bit, but in the end, you know, it's going to go North South and it's going to go into the zone. Or... Yeah. I agree. It's always going to go north south, coach. I, I agree right now. It's just the players are just too big and too fast. Um, I don't know how you make the kids go east west when you've been telling them to go north south for how many years you've been telling them to do that. There's a goal right there. I was up minus. Um, but yeah, it's when you're telling the kids to go one direction for how many years you've been taught that, now you're going to tell them to go east west. I mean, it's hard to do that. But and I, I'm not saying it's ever going to get to that point, but um, just it was a different style, different game. It's just how it was. I mean, just in every sport, the game evolves in different ways. And I, I think you can a little bit. Well, I guess, Joel, this will be a good question to ask you, uh, putting you on the spot here. But I feel like um, a little bit the second year we were together, Joe, and for sure last year, I got away from – um, maybe who I am as a coach. And I think I got myself into too much of um, what we're actually talking about right now. And I've, we've been skating, what, eight weeks. Um, I haven't said one thing one time about uh, anybody turning the puck over. And I've actually asked you guys to make, like, make a play, B to D, I don't care what happens. Um, you know, I, I don't know if you guys feel any different about it, but um, I, I do think that you're always going to have, you know, the D zone's never going to be different than it was when you guys play. Like, it's just not like you have to stop the puck. You got to defend. You just have to do that. Um, but I do think, you know, I think I jammed our players up a little bit um, the last two years um, talking about, you know, turning the puck over some of those things. And, and you can't be who you want to be when you're nervous, when you don't have confidence and you're afraid of, you know, so I don't know. I think you can a little bit to, to that degree. And I don't know if you guys don't notice any difference this year, Joe, but um, I've made an effort to, to really get back to kind of who I am and, and get away from worrying about, you know, always putting it in different spots. Yeah. And I mean, there's a time and place for it. Like you'll never get mad at us if, you know, we're playing with speed and there's effort there on the line and you're trying to make a play versus you're slow and your feet are like, standing still and and then you're turning over the puck that's when I mean issues are going to happen so I mean you give us leeway to be creative and I know the boys like that so I go, I go I go back to what coach said uh quite some time back and he said along as far as letting the players play and like you know, you have to have some freedom to your game. I mean, everyone does. I mean, but as far as how the game was played back then and how the game's played now, it's it's different. I mean, you have to you make adjustments, but but <laughs> there's your play, coach. <laughs> I think I was on the ice for that. Uh, but holy moly, how does that even happen? What is a good save by Billy? But um yeah, you, Joe, you have to have some freedom in your game. Now, all of a sudden, but the coach said a long time ago, said, like, when do you make that When do you make that decision of this isn't good enough, I'm just going to chip it in or throw it back in the corner? I mean, that's the decision that separates a lot of players. I mean, yeah. 
I mean, when you cycle up the boards and you got nothing and you decide to throw a saucer pass over three sticks to somebody in the far dots, that's probably not the best decision. So, you know, the guys that are willing to just kind of bite the bullet and throw it back down at the corner at the, at the time, it might not be maybe the best play, but at the time it's probably the right play. So, I mean, so the, I, I appreciated that when coach said that is sometimes the decisions when you don't have the perfect play in mind, that you have to make the simple safe play. That's the play to make. I think that's what's some really good players. You know, try it, try it, try it, try it. Oops, okay. You better just outlet this puck. Yep. You know, you know I, I think when players learn to put pucks in areas where they can still control the play without possession, then you know you got a good package. And I want to talk as we get into the uh, first overtime period here now. Just the difference in when Billy Pye makes that outstanding save and completely stones the to, with what five seconds left. I think you have one more face off and you get into this overtime. Did that change your mentality going into this overtime? Because it went from, wow, we just blew a 7 4 lead to. Wow, we got out of there with a save. Billy just saved our season and championship aspirations. I mean, to me, just as a spectator, that felt huge watching that right now. Did that have an impact on you going in to that first or that intermission following regulation? Yeah, I know for me it did. I, I think I said to Walt at the time, I said, I think that, that save was big for Billy. Like, if he'd had to go to the locker room after they had just scored, you know, then you have a whole different mindset. But, you know, he comes up with a tremendous save that saves the game and then goes into the locker room. And I, I think, uh, I kind of remember walking in and dead, dead quiet and, you know, down. And I think I said at the time, look, guys, you know, if we were just starting the game 0 0 and we had one period and first goal wins, we'd take our chances, you know, and I think we just went out and played. And I think they just went out and played. I, I think that's a huge point what coach said because we talked about this a while back is after we they tied it up. I I could, quite honestly don't remember the coaches even coming in or saying more than five or six words. Um, sometimes less is more. I mean, we knew what we did. I mean, we knew we were, had a good team and we knew we could win the hockey game, but our coaches came in and they were so calm. They walked in like it was just, you know, we were playing – Michigan Tech on another normal weekend in January. So that in itself calmed us down. So you know, you're usually, you're, you respond to people around you, whether you're a player or a coach or whatever, you're always going to respond to how people are acting around you. If somebody's acting <laughs> very actively, whether it's your coach or a player, you're always going to respond to that. As a player, at least in my opinion, our coaches came in and it was like ho-hum and we moved on. We, we, Billy made a big save. We moved on. So, um, we've been in that position before and we knew, we knew how, what kind of type of team we had and we expected nothing less from anybody else sitting beside us. I mean, that's all you can ask from each other. I tell you, I mean, I remember being down three, nothing in the first period and it never looked like there was a panic button that was hit. It never looked like any less than a confident team. And it was funny at the end of the first period, I was working feeding stats to, to Tom Mees and Wally Shaver up at the top. And Tom asked me after the first, he says, what do you think? I said, if Northern scores the next goal, they win the game. And he looked at me like I was crazy. And it just, it, it just never seemed like you guys, you know, we just put the hard hats on and went back to work. Yeah, I know. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead please. Go ahead, coach. Well, I say in overtime, I know on the bench, I just had such a belief that we had any number of players who could create the goal, that, that we had a great chance to win the game. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know how to rephrase this. What I just said is that could we, I just remember going into the locker room and yeah, we realized we'd just given up a three goal lead, but we also realized that like coach said, when they came in, we, if you asked us back in September, if we wanted to be a 
tie game going to the national championship game. I mean, every single guy would have jumped up and done jumping jacks for that matter. So um, we had a competent group. I mean, and, and we, like I said earlier, we, we were a team that could win in a lot of different ways. I think as a coach or as a player, you want to be able to win in different ways. You, you can't be a team that's, that I'm going to win scoring goals. I'm going to win playing defense. You have to be able to make adjustments. And I think the teams, you know, the game, the way the game is played today, obviously you have to make adjustments. And I, I think we were a team that could do that. Coach, you, you, you probably, I'm sure you did this, and you know, you still do it today. Going into a year, you, you know, the season's over and it's the summer and, you know, you start looking at, you know, people in your league and, and what they're returning and what you're returning. And um, now obviously different guys have good years and poor years and people get hurt going into this year. I mean, like how good did you think you could be before the year starts, you know, sitting in the summer and, you know, you're returning, you know, boy, like nowadays somebody returns a hundred goals. And I mean, it's crazy. I mean, you guys probably returned, you know, a hundred and a half at least um maybe 200 um did you feel like this team going into this year you know was hey like if we don't you know have chances to hang some banners i'm going to be disappointed i think so you know i think as a coach you evaluate your team and what his chances are i mean are you legit you know or does everything have to go right for you to win and i think you know we've been building <clears throat> i think for the, you know, the year previous to this and the year previous to that you know, our package was pretty darn good. You know, we're just kind of getting it mature enough and <clears throat> brought long enough to get to that point. So I, I think our confidence level as coaches was extremely high on what this team was, you know, the type of year it could have. So I don't think there's anything surprising at any point that we we're doing, well. maybe, you know, going undefeated for as long as we did, you know, that type of thing or the stretch, you know, what did we win, 38 games or something? I mean, that's, it's unheard of today. You know, I don't know if we'll ever see that again. You know, Coach, I'll never forget that conversation you had with us at Chris. It was, it was right around Christmas time. Um, and we just lost a game or close to it. And you said to us, in order for us to win the WCHA, at, which at that time was incredibly important because we obviously you win the playoffs and some of that, you get that. You said we have to go undefeated. We never lost a game after that. I'll never forget that. You challenged us. I, I'll never – I've talked to Suki and Louie. I'm like, am I, am I wrong with saying this? But did he say that? He goes, oh, he said that. So I'll never forget that. You, you challenged us. We never – we won, like you said, 30-some-odd games in a row from that point on. So we had a good we had a good veteran group. Our seniors were unbelievable that year. Mm -hmm. You know, and I thought we should have won it the next year, too. No. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We don't have to talk about that. I know. It still drives me crazy. Terrible. But that's how, that's how it works, right? Like, you, like to win, like, the regular season, you're probably the best team. You know, to win the playoffs, you're probably one of the two or three. But, but to win the national championship, you're probably one of, I don't know, five, seven teams that, that can win it. And then, like, you have to play well. You have to match up right with people. But you kind of got to get lucky, too, to, like, finish the deal. You know, like, you got to get the, you know, the, everything's got to bounce your way. And it's funny you say the next year, like, you feel like you're good enough and something just happens. You know, you, you, you match up wrong or you one of your guys, you know, best players doesn't play well, or whatever it is. Um, it's just it's so hard to, to actually win the last game of the year I mean, it is just, you know, people that, you know, have been in some of those situations understand it, but like, you got to have a little bit of luck to you too. You know, you do because, you know, bad memory for Dallas, but the next year we're up on Michigan 6-3 in the regional final late in the second period, you know, and then a certain referee calls five straight penalties on us. They score in a five on three to make a 6-4. We score on a five on four and make it six five early in the third, and then they come back and tie it, and we can't stop, you know, the flow at that time. And uh, they eventually score the winner on 
kind of a long slap shot, but uh, that was the difference in the two teams. And that haunts me to this day, coach. Trust me, haunts me. Yeah, but like, I, I, that's that's what I always like. I try to tell kids. Uh, I I coach my youngest. Like, momentum is huge in sports. It's huge, and you watch this game is a good example of that. And our game the year following year, I mean, whatever team is has the momentum is dominating the hockey game, and like, we're obviously back on our heels at the end of the third period. But momentum in sports. Kids don't realize what momentum is. Really, they you probably can't even smell it unless you ask them to YouTube it or whatever the hell they do on their phones. Um, but like, it it just it's just a matter of like there's those, those five minute spurts in games where you can dominate and you can literally win or lose a hockey game in that five to eight minute span just by playing well or not playing well. You can shut it down. You can turn it on. Whatever you got, it's hard to score goals. You can obviously turn it down a lot more play defensive a lot more but momentum is just it's huge those five minute turn spurts that the teams have that they have success in makes it makes a huge difference you talk about that too dallas like we talk all the time about the team that wins a 10 minute game usually wins a 60 minute game nowadays like if you, if you score first and win first to be down one or two like even if you if you look at college hockey the team that scores first, their their winning percentage is like nowadays it's like seven or eight hundred. To be right. down three nothing, and in that moment, and and like being in that moment, you for sure sit there and go like, uh, how, I, how is this happening? You know, like how are we down to be able to come out of that? Is it's incredible to be honest. Like to to come out of it as quick as it was, it was like boom, 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 boom. Yeah. You know. It, that's I mean whether, whether or not like the game ended up eight seven or whatever ended up right. the fact that you're down three to nothing in the national championship and you can settle yourself to come out of it it's crazy that would look like that was almost game over right there yeah I, I think you're I think you're a product of your environment I mean we were an environment we had coach and Walt and we've had that same environment for so long we knew what they're gonna do the way they reacted was the way we were gonna react. Um, you know, everybody knew when coach got mad. I mean, everyone knew when coach was upset, whether he was going to talk to the referee or whether he wasn't, but he didn't say much back there, you know, unless he wanted to personally point something out to you. So you, you are a product of what you're around. Um, so, you know, I say that, uh, I, I coach my youngest kids. I try to be a good example, not obviously a good example a lot of times, but you, what you respond to as a player when I played at the highest levels, college level, you respond to the people that are around you and how they respond. Um, and we, uh, we responded just exactly how they responded. I mean, they're like, they, they just, you know, they took it like a, I don't like these is probably the wrong phrase, but a can of corn. They were, they were calm, collected. They didn't put any more stress on us than it had to be in. We, we responded like that. We responded like we, we did all the time. We, we've been in that situation. Well, that's, that's a testament to you too, coach. Cause that's, you know, you get to that game and you think about how long, you know, how hard it is to get there too and how good your team had played and all that stuff to, to keep, you know, everybody on the bench to keep everybody in the bench in it. That's, I mean, it's why you won. I mean, it's a huge part of it, obviously. Well, it's big, you know, and I think now, now I've got all kinds of time in my you know, hand. I think the most difficult thing for me right now at this time of my life is I don't have a team to try to make better to create the opportunity to play for a championship. And I really miss that. And I think every single year, my goals were always the same, get better as the year went on to try to win something. So that I always thought every game was really important. And when you're out of coaching and you don't have it anymore, there's nothing to replace it. I mean, absolutely nothing. You know, I walk three or four times a day and it doesn't matter whether I do the lap fast or slow. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> nothing changes. So, you know, it's, it's a, you know, so that feeling, like you said, when you get to a national championship game, if you're lucky, 
you know, that, and it's tough to get there. It's, it was tough then, it's tough today because everything can go right for a long time. And then all of a sudden, a couple of nights don't go well and you're out, it's gone for one night. And so when you do get the opportunity to play, boy, you know, if you, if you can take advantage of it and make it happen, then you should be very proud of what you did. Coach, you got a the lot, to it twice. A, lot of, a lot of people say it's harder to get there than it is to win it, and I completely agree in a lot of different avenues, but that was harder to win than it was to get there, Coach. <laughs> that was hard. That was so hard. That's right. Coach, how did, how did winning the first one with Northern, how did that affect when you had a chance to do it again down at Michigan State? Different team, different personality of a team. <laughs> How did you like kind of compare and contrast, contrast how you approach the game and how the first one affected the second? I don't think my approach was any different. The teams were completely different in the sense we were the best, if not the best team, pretty much all year with this team. The Michigan State team, I think, finished third or fourth in the league and, you know, didn't win the playoffs and, you know, were good enough to make the national tournament. And then we were really good for four straight games, you know, and, I, and my belief now is that it's tougher than it, as it is to get there. You only have to be the best team in the country for four games, you know, and especially the best team in the country for one game. And so I think my approach when we got to St. Louis with the Michigan State team is I've been there and, you know, we've been there, we've done it. You know, we lost in 80, we lost in 81, we won in 91, you know, we lost in 92, but, you know, I, I think, my expectations or approach weren't any different. And, and I think our team at Michigan State and a lot of the characteristics mentally that this team had, they weren't as gifted offensively, but players like Kennedy and Applicator and, you know, and the guys like that were really good, solid players who played 200 feet like Dallas said. And we played, we beat a BC team that I think was more talented, you know, in top end talent than we did. The more players who play the National Hockey League but they weren't any better mentally than we were. There's a penalty. Is it called? <laughs> Probably not. There's one too. <laughs> and one of the penalties. Oh boy. Well, that was a goalpost one. That was. Yeah, that's the goal. Short side goalpost and it slides right across the goal line to the yeah. other. He just kind of sat there. And if, you know, it's funny, right off this face-off, he dally, Tony Zabel goes down and hits the crossbar from the blue line. Yes, from center ice. <laughs> the, uh, the right clanged it, and a slap shot that dropped and went right off the crossbar. There's the post. Oh, look at that. Oh, oh there's the post. <laughs> so I went post to Brad Ski, back to the post, then yeah. across the blue line. Oh, that had to seem like eternity. Yeah, you know what happened? I, I remember that play. I had one leg over the bench. I remember, <laughs> like, I, I was like, "It's over." I'll never forget that. I tell I tell a story at different banquets I've taught that when that this play happened, I took a step over the bench to go out the door. Jack Parker was one of my best friends, and I was just going to go quickly and shake hands. You know, I disappointed that we lost, and when I saw the puck didn't go in, I had to quickly pivot, step back over to the back of the bench. Again, and pretend nothing happened. That Zaves just hit the crossbar right there, like outside the blue line. He was like a wobbling puck. I'm like, you're not really going to shoot that, are you? Crossbar. Should have known. <laughs> There's still a dent in that crossbar. You get it. <laughs> now you know. You know. There's another story here, Grant. That uh, Tony Zabel was from Flint, Michigan. His mom and dad couldn't come to St. Paul, and you talked about Dallas being superstitious a minute ago. So they were watching the game on TV and in the middle of the room, they'd set a couple of Tony's hockey things, one of Tony's jersey and a hockey puck and Daryl Plan one of the stick that was Daryl Plandowski's stick. And then Daryl scores the winning goal. <laughs> My favorite, and I've told this to many of folks, is that when we won, Zabe said, hey, we got to go see Reagan. And George Bush was president. 
<laughs> that, that's how you go from being a freshman. He's so excited. He's like, we get to go see Reagan. Like, yeah, he's George Bush's Pres president for a little bit. That was great. Oh, my gosh. Oh, at the senior banquet, I remember he, he goes, yeah, from, from freshman to senior. Boy, that was a quick four years. <laughs> what a great banquet that was, too. Oh, that was fun. Oh, boy. 1,200 people at Lakeview Arena. Jeez. I can't even imagine, like, what the community of Marquette was like for the next 10 days. I mean, it must have just been phenomenal. Even getting back there, we, we landed at the airport. Weather was crappy, and there were people, they weren't shoulder to shoulder, but they lined the highway from, from the airport at that time was, you know, just outside to, towards Nagani. For about 12 miles, there were people all the way along the highway back to Lakeview, and, yeah. you know, and then over to Hedgecock, and it was great. It was tremendous. So, yeah, all the way down to Lakeview, there's people there. It was, it was yeah. amazing. It was incredible. They, Northern, they did a great job of getting us what we wanted. Like, we flew in, and everybody had their own cabs or chauffeur type things. And back to Lakeview, Arena, it was, it was amazing. Did you guys stay the night in St. Paul this night? Yes. Yes. What time do you think you guys got done with your team meal after? I mean, it must have been one, two in the morning. Well, I don't think we had a team meal. No. Oh. <laughs> we dally. We did those days. We didn't have the budget. No. Oh. We had meals. team other stuff, Coach. We had team other stuff. We were just scrambling <laughs> to get other other substances in our body, but lots going uh, on. Yeah. St. Paul Hotel was active that night. But if you remember yeah. the, the stories about that's where everybody was so upset, you know, and it was a mess. But it was yeah. great. It was a mess at times. And it was a great, but it was a mess. Yeah, you're right. But it was sweet. I remember walking back to the hotel with Soup, my roommate, and just, you know, it was like, holy, we just won a national championship. You know, you're walking back. It wasn't a far walk, but it was. <laughs> We, you know, you're just trying to get back, and we had a little, you know, get together with everyone in the hotel. The parents who were there it was, we just couldn't get, we couldn't wait to get back to Northern. <laughs> that, that was it. How, how, how quickly could we get back to Northern? So, <laughs> I tell you, it seemed like Marquette was in time. All of Marquette was in St. Paul that night. It was just, it was, a, it was a great celebration, and just so many people so happy. And, you know the the aftermath back back at home was just you know unbel unbelievable. Rick, were you the AD at this time? Yes. What what year did you start? What year did you start that? Oh boy, um, I was AD for fourteen years. Well, I did both. Uh, when I first started, it had to be. I don't know, 85, 86. There was a chairman of the NCAA championship committee, the athletic director and the hockey coach. So <laughs> it was a busy time. <laughs> if we talk a bit about your time as AD too, I mean, you were there for what the completion of Vandermint, the Superior Dome, the Barry Event Center. How did it feel from that perspective? I mean, obviously having done coaching a lot in Lakeview Arena, to, to see the completion of a lot of this other stuff and build up all of these other programs, especially when we look at the Barry Event Center, as you did uh, during the end of your time and throughout the course of that time as athletic director also. It was great. It was tremendous. I, mean, you know, I sat in my office and watched them bring in the, the wood for the dome, you know, on, tra on train just to start to construct it. Uh, you know, we expanded Lakeview once, we added a locker room. And it was just a constant trend. I mean, I think of when I was the AD at the time, we had 13 sports and 10 of them made the NCAA tournament. So it was so important to me that everybody had success and everybody had opportunity. And I think I approach being an AD much like I approach coaching my team. You know, not quite with the anger at times, probably. <laughs> you know, my approach anyway. So I, I loved it. I, I really enjoyed it. And you know, I, I would have done it longer. I, I think it got to a point where I was kind of bumping heads with the president of the university at the time that I just said, you know what, it, this isn't worth it. So I, I gave up being the AD. But, uh, no, I, I enjoyed many aspects of being 
the AD while at the same time being able to maintain being a hockey coach, which I never could have done with a wall. I mean, I, I've, you know, Wall, Schick, Maury, Garrett, you name the, the assistants I had. And a coach, a head coach is not a great head coach without great assistants. I mean, it's absolutely critical. I mean, Walt, Walt and I meshed. We were a great team together. And, you know, he complimented things that I did. And, you know, he, he was tremendous. What were your days like? I mean, how, how much of your day did you have to spend on um, some of the administrative things of being an AD? Because you probably had to do something every day for that. I never touched hockey till after noon. You know, <clears throat> I came in at 7.30 every morning and I did strictly administrative work until noon. I went over to the arena and then there was straight hockey from noon till about six. And then the AD kicked back in for a different events at night and anything else that had to be done. So... I separated the day that way and every, all the coaches knew it. Nobody bothered me. Nobody, they knew not to try to track me down in the afternoon and either to wait, get me before noon or wait till after six. I mean, I like, if you, I don't think it's great. But <laughs> if you go back to Walt recruiting and he's, you know, Walt recruited me and coach, you recruited me and, and he recruited obviously our entire class, but like, you know, it's, it's funny. I, I, I chuckle with Walt about this a lot because, you know, he could sell ice to an Eskimo and he was, he was a fabulous, like you said, a fabulous recruiter. And I, I think that goes unnoticed in a lot of different ways because he had a, a tremendous knowledge of what he was looking for as a player. But he, I never, I'll never forget one of the funniest story, Walt stories I got is they were building the, the hospital kind of up by the, the they were there, they were look like they almost look like dorms. And, and on my recruiting trip, he's like, Walt, me, me and Dane were there. And he's like, yeah, that's, that's all the academic, just the academic guys are going in there. They're going right in there. That's where all the academic guys are going in. You're going to be all set. And that was like for <laughs> residents for the hospital. <laughs> and the next year, around the same time, we walked out of the, me and Sook walked out of the rink and, hey, what happened to those dorms? Oh, he goes, yeah, you know, I'm sorry, guys. So I just was telling you the right thing at the right time. So he was, he was fantastic. So, and, and Mooch, and I, I played for Moore's brother in Vernon. Danny was my head coach in Vernon. So that was a very easy transition for me. And Maury recruited me a little bit as well as Walt. So um, those guys were you know, instrumental in how, how much success we had. Walt was fabulous. He was, he had a hockey mind and he could really relate to the player as far as what they were thinking at the time. And we were, I was extremely lucky as a player to have the coaching staff that we did. What, what's the one word that you can relate to Walt when he was on, on the bench during the game? Bench? Red face. Big beat red face. Because oh, when, when he got mad or something like ready, it's like, you know, Walt had you know, some issues and the, his face would go be red, like like beat red, like almost like sit down, Walt. Your face is really red. So like, oh my goodness, he would get just like, your belt is too tight. I don't know what's too tight. Something on your body is too tight. Your face is really red. So. But don't you remember? It was deep, deep. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that too. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and we were good at that. We were good. We once we got it down there, we couldn't get it back from us. So he was fabulous. He was great. I mean, for me, it's so unique to have both Coach and Walt in Marquette. I mean, that's just like it, you're so lucky to have that. I mean. We bug coach all the time. I mean, last year pre-COVID, we'd get you in there every other week, it felt like, and, um, you know, be bugging you about different stuff. And, like, it's it's just – it's so nice to have, you know, just even some of these things he's talking about that, you know, you live some of this. And, um, you, know, you know, Dallas, the leadership group, and, like, um, it's just been it's, – it, it's just such a cool place and – you know, how much people care about it and they're involved in it. And, you know, to, to get, you know, people to do what you're doing right now and people of your caliber is, 
is unique. Um, so we're grateful that you guys are part of this. Appreciate that. You, know, you don't want to over <laughs> do your welcome. That's how I feel at times. But uh, it's just we have such great memory, they Dolly. I mean, that's you be part of something special and the good memories you have. And you never you never get rid of those memories. I mean, you know, no. this watching the game tonight is just going to rekindle so many thoughts, you know, for me that uh, put a smile on my face. Yes, completely agree. Yeah, I, will, I will say like every, like I've said earlier, um, everybody is a product of what you learn from or who you learn from. Um, and I tell you what, I mean, going, going to where we, where I did and playing with the players I played and the coach, the staff, I had the opportunity to play under, you, just, you learn. I mean, you're a product of your environment, whether you like it or not. Sometimes it's, it, it's um, just certain players have to deal with different than others, but, I was, I was very fortunate to play under uh, coaching staff and players that were just fabulous. So it was a lot of fun. I laugh and I look back at these um, games in this era, even like, I don't know when they finally stopped doing it, but I think it's hilarious now that like we have face off dots on the rink for a reason and referees have decided to drop the puck like three feet inside the blue line. Do you remember that? They'd be no dot there. They just dropped the puck there. And it's like, what, what do we, is that, is that where the puck went out? Do you remember when they changed that back to, to putting it back on the dot? I remember all the discussion you know, at the time as far as you know, making sure everything went to a face-off dot in that way. So, but yeah, it's just, that, well, ref, you know, because there was a time, and I think when the game was at its best, that referees controlled the game. It was an evaluator, but in a sense, it was the people that were hired by the league. They controlled games. They, so they decided a face-off was going to a certain spot, it went, and nobody questioned it. You know, now everything's so regimented for referees. It's, it's tough for them to have personality and kind of do what you think might be best for the game at that given moment. You know, so, but, you know, I do remember the discussions for face-offs especially and how paranoid everybody got about face-offs. Uh, you know, and I, I think it was a good change. I mean, I think the consistency of where face-offs are is a good thing. But it's funny, back back in the day, you always had one referee who was like, that's where the face-off is. Don't come talk to me. So yeah. like now it's like, well, somebody questions it, and then he goes and talks to somebody else, and then goes this. Back then it was like there was one referee when you knew every game, like, okay, he's this is the referee. So he's gonna run the show. And <laughs> regardless of what you thought or what he was gonna make the decision at the end of the day. So and you didn't do your if you wanted to argue about it, it probably wasn't in your best interest. So um, it's just funny how that changes. I have not seen a penalty yet. There's no penalties in overtime, right? No, I don't think so. Well, that's what I say, you know, the old time old adage used to be, you know, put your whistle away and let the players decide it instead of today's adage, which is the penalty in regulation is the penalty in overtime. Uh, happened in one of the uh, conference finals this year. Jamie Benn got his, uh, got a penalty for Dallas. It shouldn't have been a penalty. And there was all kinds of controversy. It was in the neutral zone and wasn't a scoring chance. And uh, Tampa scored to win the game. And then I think that was a 3-2 series lead or 3-1 or something. But it was kind of the dagger of the series. Right. You know, I think what's happened with officiating, I think the officials are, are fine talent-wise. You know, they, they skate better. They all skate good, basically. And, you know, they're all in pretty good shape. But I, I think, you know, different the rules committee and the NCAA decided that they could increase the offense in the game by pulling more penalties, you know, and taking some things out of the game instead of letting the game evolve. Because the game has always gone in cycles. You know, some teams are better offensively than others. Some years, they're, you know, goaltending is better than other years. Some, you know, and trying to legislate goal is, I don't think, been real healthy for the game.
there's a lot of chances in overtime. Like, both. I think I take my chance with this team today, Grant. For sure. <laughs> I was listening to a thing today and they were talking about if Ovechkin's going to get uh, Gretzky's record. And the last three years he scored, you know, it was more than the previous three. So he scored like 50, 48 and 52 or so, something like that. And they were talking about you know, how people say, you know, well, Gretzky played in there where like it was a live puck or, you know, you know, he wouldn't do that today or whatever they say. And, you know, the, the reality is like, if you look at Gretzky's stat, like there's years the next guy's like 50 points below him. And it's the same thing here. Like if you're good, you're good. Like if you were good in 91, you'd be good in yes. you know, one. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Nelly, is that your dog? Sorry. I keep muting it as quickly as I can, but she barks before I have to mute it. So sorry, guys. <laughs> Trying. By going back to your statement about whether Gretzky would score 90 today or he might not score 90, but he would score a lot. I mean, he's, I mean, as far as Ovechkin goes, is whether he's going to break his record. I mean, <laughs> I guess I mean, he's, he's got a chance. I mean, the guy, he can score. Everybody knows that. Um, but, you know, whether you're going to be a good player in today's game or the game 30 years ago, the guys 30 years ago, the elite players, they'd be, in my opinion, they'd be great players today. They just think the game a little bit differently. I think Ovechkin will break the record because he can shoot the puck so well. You know, how about this, A. Darling? Grant, we try to make come up with all these fancy new power plays, you know, to move around and move this, move that. Well, Veskin stands at the top of the circle and just yeah. stands there. He didn't move. Yeah. The whole time, it's up to everybody else to make a couple passes until they can get the puck to him so he can shoot it. And he's going to shoot it every time. Every time. It, you know, it just goes in. And everybody in the game and the building and on TV. And on the radio, knows that he's going to shoot. Yeah. Like, coming. From where? They know exactly from where. Yeah. Yeah, you can stop, you can stop a lot of things, but, you know, like, he's, you know, he's, he's, he's a little bit of a freak. He, he can shoot it where other people's, people can't. Yeah. And whether, you know, people always say he wasn't meaning to shoot it there, I, I don't agree with that. <laughs> he scored 600-something goals. He knows where it's going, so. Uh, he's going to have a chance to break it. I mean, being a little bit of old school like I am, I hope he doesn't, but, uh, but he has a chance. Yeah, he sure does. Hey, Dallas, what was um, playing against Mario like? I mean, how big and strong was Mario? Yeah, he, he's the best player I've ever, pl I've ever had the opportunity to watch or play against. Um, you know, I played against Mario when he was kind of, you know, coming back into it. I mean, obviously, he just won a Stanley Cup and he got, you know, I played against Mario at least the beginning part of my career when he was kind of, you know, couldn't, wasn't the player he was. But, you know, at 91, 92, my first, or 92, 93, my first year, uh, I played against Mario in the exhibition game. And don't ask me why he was playing in Detroit in the exhibition game, but he was. And uh, him and, and Jagger were both playing. And oh my gosh, it was like like men because we didn't have a lot of our players playing, and um, it was like a men amongst boys. He was he was like you know he's six five, two hundred and twenty five pounds at the time, and could skate around everybody and stick out or whatever. He was he was amazing. He was at my in my career when I was breaking in, I, I thought Sergey Fedorov was the at that time was the best player I've ever seen. At, at both ends of the rink, but offensively, Mario was a, just at a whole other level. Like and Stevie was really good; he scored sixty goals. Mario was at a whole other level, so it was, you know, I couldn't imagine what Gretzky was like in his a day. But yeah, he was, he was big, strong, fast, skate, shoot, score—you name it—he could do it. And it was terrifying to be on the ice in the same when he was out there. Yeah, we we have. Um... 
we have internal debates with the players every once in a while about McDavid and Joe Smile and um, versus Gretzky versus Lemieux and Cross. It's just like if you look at what those guys did versus the rest of the league, you know, like that shows you how good they were. Like everybody, the, the, the playing field was even. And like now, guys won the scoring title by like five or ten, or guys were winning it by like sixty. Like I'm sixty points better than the next best player in the NHL. Yeah. Yeah, it, it was – there was a drastic, you know, between the top 5% and the next, it was a huge drop-off. I mean, you had, you know, Mario and Messier and, and Gretzky, obviously, when I first started. Um, now you have McDavid and Dreisaitl and Panarin and the list goes on. But they were di- – it was just – it was a different game. Not, not, not that it was better, not that it was worse. But, you know, you had an elite – you know, Stevie was in that group. He was, he was, he was a group that – that you could put in there, or a player that you could put in there. So, he was, it was, he was just a different element. He was six, like you said, he was six five that could skate and score and shoot and pass. And he had Guillermo Jaeger as his, as his left winger. It was it was unstoppable. I mean, and thank God we only played him two or three times a year. It was it was terrible to play against teams like that. Hey guys in the penalty box. Big Eddie. You know what's amazing about Eddie Ward, Grant? Eddie's a right-handed shot. And, and he was a solid player. But when I moved him to his off wing, he became a really good player. Yeah. Yeah. Honest to God. You know, and it, I don't know what it, what it was exactly, but he just became a better player. He must have. Eddie, Eddie played in the NHL for a number of years. He was a very good player. I mean, and he certainly played how he had to play. Eddie made adjustments. I mean, he was he could shoot the puck coach. You know, he could really, really, really shoot it. So, yeah. And he could protect it. If he had it, you weren't getting it. No. And, and coach, you're saying that. Like, like and I keep, I'll, I'll always go back to that. But, like, you play to your strengths. I mean, he, he Eddie played to his strengths. I, I think as a team, we played to our strengths. We, we knew who we were and we knew what we could do in certain situations. We could make adjustments. We were a team that could play that game down low with you all day long. And we could, we were a team that could go up and down with you. Obviously, well, how, how, obviously how, this game was up and down, but like we, we were a team that could play in all different elements of every situation you asked us to play in. How often do you think we practiced uh, puck protection? Coach, I, like I'll, I'll never forget that. Like I tell my youngest kids to this day, I'm like, I'll never forget. And I, and I, and I try to mimic myself, unfortunately, not unfortunately, but I try to mimic myself. I'm, we're going to do this till like, you get it. Like kids nowadays or in general, they don't understand what a Joe cycling in, to me is an art. I mean, why you're cycling and, 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 and you're trying to get a benefit over that offensively. We're not cycling it just so we can throw it back in the corner. We're cycling to create an offensive opportunity. And if you watch it, this game from start to finish, we create a ton of chances off the cycle and like a, a ton. And we don't score and there's nothing said about it, but we really do create a lot of chances off the cycle. Possession for sure. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that wears down the deep. I mean, as the game goes on, they, they start get tired. I mean, defending's tiring, so. I mean, that's, that's a good plan. Yeah. Like, yeah, exactly. Like we, we cycle, cycle with a purpose. I mean, why are you cycling? Just to you get off the ice. So your next line come out, you're cycling with a purpose to score. Yeah. I mean, a lot of teams don't think about it like that. I'm cycling because I want to score. I'm not cycling just to kill it off so I can get off the ice. Cause that's, that's not fun. You're cycling with an opportunity to create an opportunity for your team to score hockey. Mm-hmm. Score goal. Great, holding out at the blue line. Oh boy! What? Hey, Grant, you've watched this winning goal, and Dally has in today's market with video review. Was it offside? You know what I'm going to say. <laughs> <laughs> it was close, though, wasn't it? It was very close. Very. I'm- Okay, think about how long that would be reviewed today. Oh, wow. Game-winning goal, triple overtime. It would be reviewed forever. 
<laughs> hey, Eddie Starr, he took a he took a penalty and took a money. Here it is. Here it is. Look at that move by the third. How good is Boof? Oh, so what a smooth. move on the blue line, though. How good is Mark Ruffay? He's so good. You know what I say, Dally? If he were playing, if he were going today from college to the National Hockey League, he'd play for 15 years. Yes, absolutely. In, in today's game. What a great, yeah. smooth move there. On the replay here, just watch how close this is. Yeah, but watch, like, like the drop pass is unreal, but Booth's patience is like more so, it's so good. He just hangs on to it, skates around everybody. I think Watch awesome. here. Oh, well, I'm going to go around this guy. Three guys. Yeah. Unreal. Hmm. I can remember when he made the pass and, and Daryl received it. It seemed like it took forever for him to shoot the puck. <laughs> you never had the quickest release, coach. So, like. <laughs> <laughs> Unreal. Grant, you had a similar experience uh, to what Daryl did there. What does that feel like the moment that puck hits a twine? Um, you almost it just, mm -hmm. you're, you're not even sure that it went in. You know, you're just so excited. And, um, you know, I'm sure that's what co coaches say. Like, it's just exactly what you see. It's exactly like, I mean, that, I mean, I, I'm sure you're like, you're so excited, but you can't actually believe that you did it, that you guys won. I'm sure you're saying, I knew we were going to win the whole game. What are you talking about? We had this thing in the bag from the beginning. <laughs> I, 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 I'll, I'll give you my two cents on that. It's like, you know, you, as far as what you feel at the end of the game, there isn't really a feeling you're just kind of numb a little bit. You want to like hug your teammates. Um, you know, there's a situation where, <laughs> you know, obviously we shake hands, but, but like you, you just want to be around your teammates. You want to hug your coaches. You want to say, thank you. You want to realize how long this year has been. I mean, it's a journey it really is. It's from start to finish to, you know, Teams that win at the end of the year, it's it's a, it really is a journey. And like I um, tell kids or you know college teams or whoever I have a chance to talk to, I mean, it, it, enjoy the journey and, and, and embrace it. I mean, it, that's something I will that, that brings back. I still get chills when I watch stuff like that. I, I mean, it's 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 amazing for me to have an opportunity to sit and watch the, that game. But I tell you what, it's it really is it's something that you'll never forget. And you have to cherish every minute of it. Yeah, absolutely. And so that championship, the golden crown on yeah. top of the season, NMU ends that year 38, 5 and 4, which to my knowledge, still one of the best records in NCAA hockey history. You got to be at least top five or six, at least from what I'm thinking of right here off the top of my head. Again, everyone, current NMU hockey head coach Grant Patoni, former. Head coach and athletic director Rick Comley, also Joe Nardi, Dallas Drake, and of course, Radio Results Network hockey play by play man Dave Dennis. Guys, really been fun watching this with you. Blast. Okay, thanks. And thanks folks, for having me. Appreciate it, guys. Dallas, Rick, like Joe and I really appreciate you guys being part of this and, um, you know, kind of getting our season kicked off the right way with, you know, with the slow start with COVID and, um, nothing will be more exciting for our fan base than to, to bring this back um, about a week before we play. So thanks for, for joining us tonight. Good Thank luck. Much, guys. Have a great Good luck, guys. And you. folks, hope you've enjoyed watching along with us. If this doesn't get you excited for the upcoming season, as we just talked about, 
I don't know what will the games going to be broadcast over the radio 100.3 the point in Marquette 107.3 in Escanaba and online at rrnsports.com make sure you follow along the Northern Michigan University Athletic Social Media accounts also to view all of our Wildcat focus sessions as they occur. That'll do it for this one, though. Derek Maselli saying thanks for watching with us.